Okay. Um, this should be live. I think everything will be working okay. Um, I might unplug and replug my mic in just in case it messes up. Okay, that should be good, I hope. Um, so, okay, after probably not enough preparation the coming past few days, <coughs> I am going to do this philosophy stream, which I was supposed to do last Sunday, but I played too much Pokemon. Um, now that's... That's too big. Um, sorry, I thought I had this right. Shit. It's uh, entirely too big. Um, is that okay? No, everything's too big. <laughs> Oh boy. Okay. Um My god. Now I'm embarrassed. Okay. <laughs> now I can make my face bigger. Um You see so tricky. Let me just crop it some more. That's pretty good. Chat bigger, face bigger. <laughs> Doesn't fit. Oh. Um, now I'm just getting a little picky here. That's, that's the way it's going to be. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, um, no, it's bothering me. It's really killing me. Um, I'm going to wait for some more people to come in because... Um, I don't want to read it with nobody in the room. Wow, this is... <laughs> Fuck me. I thought I had it all worked out. I don't. Um... Not even close. So, I'm going to keep talking. I'm supposed to be reading the Theogony today by Hesiod. <clears throat> um, I'm going to say the author and stuff in a minute. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm really distracted by this. I got some notes. I got some things I want to talk about. Um... Oh, shit. Why was it so messed up? <laughs> now the chat's so little. Oh, man. Um, I'm going to talk about, like, five different topics if I have time. I'm pretty tired from a mountain hike yesterday. <laughs> Um, that's kind of better. Coach Lance with the Keezy emotes. What's up, Paul? Um, I think I'm getting everything <laughs> sorted out real quick, which I thought I had, but I didn't. <clears throat> so I'm a little embarrassed. Um, this shit always happens to me <laughs> every single day. I'm sick of it, but it is what it is. Good to see you here, Paul. Um, at least somebody's here. 
besides sunset <laughs> for me to start um, reading in a minute once I get the stupid width right on my chat box. <laughs> oh god, 700. That's as close as I'm gonna get. Okay. Paul's here. I think maybe that's enough. I know more people are supposed to be here. Herschel, Brady. Um. <coughs> I hope I don't disconnect a bunch today. <coughs> Gotta get my throat just right. Um. Let's see here. My notes. Um. <laughs> saying something that revolutionizes thinking and then disconnect. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much how it goes these days. I guess I should get to the top of the text. Um, I can do this before people come in. <clears throat> this is on Wikisource. Um, this is the freest one I could find, although I didn't look that hard. Um, this is the link. Um, if you want to read along and have the text, is a good idea um, I'm gonna post I have to post I have to post the um, I went to the library to grab a copy they only had one that was checked out yeah you want to have the same version um, this version is even different <coughs> than the usual version that I know um, but I can't use that one um, I have to put up this license uh, so I don't get copyrighted um, and I have to say <laughs> it is from Hesiod the Homeric Hymns in Homerica 1920 um, it's by Hesiod but it's translated by H.G. Evelyn White um, it's from this book that I mentioned it's pages 79 to 155 um, I hope that's good enough. <laughs> I posted the fucking Creative Commons license and stuff, so... <clears throat> um, I tried, you know. <laughs> that's the best I can do. Unless there's uh, something else. Share link license. That seems, that seems good enough for me. <laughs> I am going to skip some parts. Um... If you're following along, I'll tell you um, when I'm going to skip and show you where I'm going to next. The wiki source link didn't work. Really? What if I click on it? Did you follow a link from a different website? There is a permalink feature to avoid this. There is a link titled permalink in the toolbox on the left. Toolbox on the left. Tools. Permalink. Did I get it? I pressed permalink. <laughs> Hold on. If you have a blah 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 blah. They can become broken. There's a permalink feature. So if I click on the permalink, does it automatically go to my uh, clipboard? Probably. Here, let me try this. Nope, <laughs> that's just the Creative Commons license again. Maybe it did it up here. Let me try this one. Nope. 
Okay. <laughs> when I click on permanent link, I it just reloads the page a little bit. Cite this page. I could have downloaded it as a PDF. I didn't realize that. Um, yeah, it is weird. Um, is this Creative Commons thing work? Of course the fucking legal license works. That's what I want, right? <sighs> as a result, links from external lights can become broken. There's a permalink feature to avoid this. Not only does the link remain intact, but the page content remains at precisely the version when the link was added. Copying and pasting the whole link worked. Okay. Sweet. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what else to say in preference, preference to this, to preface this. I better get my mouth going, working right. Um, Lithiogony was written forever ago by this poet dude named Hesiod. Um, it is an account account of the origin of the universe. It's a cosmology. Um, it's a cosmogony, all those fucking things. Um, yeah, how the universe came to be how the gods came to be and all of their lineages and gene genealogies um genealogies um i don't know brown cow yeah um it's important for philosophy because uh lots of the themes and ideas in it um inspired mostly one really big important one um inspired the pre-socratics and Plato, Socrates, and maybe probably Aristotle to some extent. I haven't really read Aristotle. Um, but, <clears throat> I mean, I've read him some. Not enough to say about this, in, about his relation to Hesiod. Um, yeah, it's kind of a big deal, but kind of not well known. At the library, I grab books on Aristotle and Descartes, though read the Aristotle one first yeah good luck with that I heard that he's tough um, my professors were under the impression that Aristotle wasn't for undergraduates putting Descartes before the horse that's an old one <laughs> heard that joke a lot um, in, uh, in college <sighs> Well, I'm going to wait just a little bit longer. It's already 9.14. Aristotle, Aristotle isn't all that hard. I don't know why my professors thought that. They just... Like, if you could do Plato, you could do Aristotle. I don't know. My professors just refused to teach Aristotle. We just did him a little bit once. Um... It was just, I don't know. I think he was done to death for them, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> maybe they wanted to do something else. Maybe I'll email them and ask them. Uh, he was an OG dude in your philosophy class who wouldn't shut the fuck up. Yeah, he's kind of... I mean, there's a lot of arrogant philosophers, but from what I read about him, he's not the most woke guy around, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> a bit arrogant, makes a lot of claims, um, not as like speculative as some of them. Did I take an ethics course? No, they didn't author. I don't think there was any offered um, when I was there. Um, it's a lot smaller school. Um, I mean, of course, we talked about ethical, like, things and stuff. That's where Aristotle would have come in a lot. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, I did read the Nicomachean Ethics um, for Philosophy of Law. Um, there's some stuff about it in that, but um, not like a whole class on ethics. There was a class on, what the hell is it called? Um, bioethics. So probably would have been that, but that's like the only class I didn't take. It was taught by a different professor, like kind of outside the department, so I didn't want to mess with it. Um. <clears throat> okay, it's been three more minutes. I'm going to start at 9.20. It's 9.17 for me. Um, I think 20 minutes is a fine grace period. Um, I'm not going to... Bioethics is more about ethical experimentation as opposed to ethics within humans and humanity. Yeah, but um, I know that what I did hear about Aristotle, he has a lot of uh, interesting ideas on anthropological um, versus the animal, um, separating human from animal. Um, so I think that you could possibly use Aristotle in a bioethics course. I know that it's more about like the science and um what is that book I read in high school? Uh The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, like that kind of thing, like who owns your genes and um your rights to your cells and stuff like that. Um but if you want to do some fundamental stuff between anthropological views on humans versus animals and then maybe ethical concerns somehow um that might be a bit out there but uh, maybe i'm just defending this too hard because i don't really know what i'm talking about that much but um, i was just thinking maybe it's possible but <coughs> anyways um Two more minutes. I'm going to keep drinking water. Um, <sighs> Paul, are you, like, really familiar with this? Are you going to, like, fight me on every turn <laughs> about this or something? <clears throat> um... I'm just curious. To me, all my all the most of the interpretations I'm going to make are standard because it's how I learn to interpret it. Um, I don't know if they're going to like seem crazy to you or anything. <laughs> I don't know, man. I just want to do this shit. Um, let's see what happens. I'm not familiar with theogony, but I do always have first impressions on readings of philosophy. Often, okay. Um, one of my professors is a specialist in ancient Greek philosophy, and he was obsessed with this text. I think every single class I took with him, he brought it up almost every day and was it, assigned it at least part of it as a reading for every class. Um, yes. Uh, so I've heard a lot about it. I've read it some a couple times. Um, I haven't read the whole thing all the way through, I'm going to say, out loud. I've read, like, half of it out loud. Um, I'm going to stumble on some of the names. I don't, I'm not that familiar with uh, Latin or ancient Greek pronunciation all the time. From first glance, it seems like the text to begin philosophy in one of the classics of ancient Greek literature. It's true. Um, this is one of the first accounts of the universe um, that came before like um, philosophy in ancient Greek times so it was pretty big for them um, okay I'm not gonna do I don't remember if I said this already I'm not gonna do any interpretations while I'm reading I'm just gonna read through the thing and then I'm gonna go through my topics um, point to certain certain parts that I think are salient to specific topics um maybe read some quotes and um probably some of it will be a little bit of lecture and then at the end of each topic i'll leave space for discussion 
um, and questions, uh, you're, you're welcome to comment while I'm reading. Um, if you think something is, there are some strange slash funny parts, um, and some things that are kind of shocking. Um, if you want to comment, feel free. Um, uh, I might or may or may not pause to read your comment. Um, okay. <clears throat> Here I go. 921, let's go. Let me get close to my mic here. From the Heliconian Muses, let us begin to sing. Who hold the great and holy mount of Helicon and dance on soft feet about the deep blue spring and the altar of the almighty son of Kronos. And when they have washed their tender bodies in Primesus <coughs> or in the horse's spring of Olmius, make their fair lovely dances upon highest Helicon and move their vigorous feet. Thence they arise and go abroad by night, veiled in thick mist, and utter their songs with lovely voice, praising Zeus, the Aegis Holder, and queenly Hera of Argos, who walks on golden sandals, and the daughter of Zeus, the Aegis Holder, bright-eyed Athene, and Phobaeus Apollo, <coughs> and Artemis, who delights in arrows, and Poseidon, the Earth Holder, who shakes the earth, and reverend Themis, and quick-glancing Aphrodite, and Hebe with the crown of gold, and fair Dione, Leto, Iapetus, and Kronos, the crafty counselor, Aeos, and great Helios, and bright Selene, Earth too, and great Oceanus, and dark night, and the holy race of all the other deathless ones that are forever. And one day they taught Hesiod glorious song while he was shepherding his lambs under holy Helicon. Uh, and, and this word first, uh, the goddesses said to me, the muses of Olympus, daughters of Zeus, who holds the Aegis. <clears throat> so the muses are giving Hesiod inspiration, um, and this is what they're saying to him. Shepherds of the wilderness, wretched things of shame, mere bellies, we know how to speak many false things as though they were true, but we know when we will to utter true things. So, said the ready-voiced daughters of great Zeus, and they plucked and gave me a rod, a shoot of sturdy olive, a marvelous thing, and breathed into me a divine voice to celebrate things that shall be and things that were aforetime, and they bade me sing of the race of the blessed gods that are eternally, but ever to sing of themselves both first and last. But why all this about oak and stone? Um, this line about why all this about oak and stone is like, why am I making a big deal about this? That's what it says in the footnotes. Um, some kind of ancient Greek saying, come thou, let us begin with the muses who gladden the great spirit of their father Zeus in Olympus and their songs, telling of things that are and that shall be and that were aforetime and consent with consenting voice. Unwearying flows the sweet sound from their lips and the house of their father Zeus, the Lord Thunderer is glad at the lily-like voice of the goddesses as it spreads around, and the peaks of snowy Olympus resound, and the homes of the immortals. <clears throat> and they, uttering their immortal voice, celebrate in song, first of all, the reverend races of the gods from the beginning, those whom earth and wide heaven begot, and the gods sprung of these, givers of good things. Then, next, the goddesses sing of Zeus, the father of gods and men, as they begin and end their strain, how much he is the most excellent among the gods and supreme in power. And again, they chant the race of men and strong giants and gladden the heart of Zeus within Olympus, the Olympian muses, daughters of Zeus, the Aegis holder. Okay, so this is um, going to be about how the Zeus, how Zeus bore uh, and fathered the muses. Them in Pieria did Mimosini, uh, which it means memory, who reigns over the hills of Eloither, bear of union with the father, the son of Kronos, a forgetting of ills and a rest from sorrow. For nine nights did wise Zeus lie with her, entering her holy bed, remote from the immortals. And when a year was passed, and the seasons came round as the months waned, and many days were accomplished, she bare nine daughters, all of one mind, whose heart are set upon song and their spirit free from care, a little way from the topmost peak of snowy Olympus. There are their bright dancing places with beautiful homes, and beside them the graces and himorous desire live in delight, 
and they and they uttering through their lips a lovely voice sing the laws of all and the goodly ways of the immortals uttering their lovely voice <clears throat> then they went to olympus delighting in their sweet voice with heavenly song and the dark earth resounded about them as they chanted and a lovely sound rose up beneath their feet as they went to their father and he was reigning in heaven himself holding the lightning and glowing thunderbolt when he had overcome by might his father Kronos, and distributed fairly to the immortals their portions and declared their privileges. So this stuff with Zeus overthrowing Kronos hasn't happened yet. This is like a future kind of thing that the muses can see into the future and stuff like that. <clears throat> These things then the muses sang who dwell on Olympus, nine daughters begotten by great Zeus, Cleo, Euterpe, Thalia, Melpomene, Ter Terpsichore, and Erato, Polyemnia, Urania, and Calliope, who is the finest of them all, for she attends on worshipful princes, whomsoever of, or of heaven nourish princes the daughters of great Zeus honor, and behold him at his birth. They pour sweet dew upon his tongue, and from his lips flow gracious words. All the people look toward him while he settles causes with true judgments, and he, speaking surely, would soon make wise and even of a make wise end even of a great quarrel for therefore are their princes wise in heart because when the people are being misguided in their assembly they set right the matter again with ease persuading them with gentle words and when he passes through a gathering they greet him as a god with gentle reverence and he is conspicuous amongst the assembled such as the holy gift of the muses to men for it is though the muses um, for it is though the muses and far-shooting Apollo that there, oh, I'm sorry, let me start again. For it is through the muses and far-shooting Apollo that there are singers and harpers upon the earth, but princes are of Zeus, and happy is he whom the muses love. Sweet flows speech from his mouth. For though a man have sorrow and grief in his newly troubled soul and live in dread because his heart is distressed, Yet when a singer, the servant of the muses, chants the glorious deeds of men of old and the blessed gods who inhabit Olympus, at once he forgets his heaviness and remembers not his sorrows at all. But the gods of the goddesses, but the gifts of the goddesses soon turn him away from these. <laughs> Hail, children of Zeus, grant lovely song and celebrate the holy race of the deathless gods who are forever. Those... <laughs> those that were born of earth and starry heaven and gloomy night and them that briny sea did rear tell how it, the first gods and earth came to be and rivers and the boundless sea with its raging swell and the gleaming stars and the wide heaven above and the gods who were born of them givers of good things how they divided their wealth and how they shared their honors amongst them. Also how at first they took many folded Olympus. These things declare to me from the beginning, ye muses who dwell in the house of Olympus, and tell me which of them first came to be. Verily, at the first chaos, chaos, sorry, chaos came to be, but next, wise, wide-bosomed earth, also called Gaia, the ever sure foundation of all the deathless ones who hold the peaks of snowy olympus and dim tartarus in the depth of the wide pathed earth and eros love fairest amongst the among the deathless gods who unnerves the limbs and overcomes the mind and wise counsels of all gods and all men within them from chaos came forth erebus and black night but of night were born aether and day whom she conceived and bare from union in love with erebus and earth first bare starry heaven, also called Uranus, um, which is also usually can look like Uranus, but <laughs> it's really Uranus um, or Uranus. <clears throat> okay, earth first bare starry Uranus, equal to herself to cover her on every side and to be an ever sure abiding place for the blessed gods. And she brought forth long hills, graceful haunts of the goddess nymphs, who dwell amongst the glens of the hills. She bare also the fruitless deep with his raging swell Pontus, without sweet union of love. But afterwards she lay with heaven and bare deep-swirling Oceanus, 
Coeus and Creus and Hyperion and Iapetus, Theia and Rhea, Themis, Mimosini, and gold-crowned Phoebe and lovely Tethys. After them was born Cronos the wily, youngest and most terrible of her children, and he hated his lusty sire. Um, Cronos hates Uranos, his dad. Um, that's a that's an important plot point. And again, she bore she bare the Cyclopes, uh, overbearing in spirit, Brontes, Stereopes, and stubborn-hearted Argus, who gave Zeus the thunder and made the thunderbolt. In all else, they were like the gods, but one eye only was set in the midst of their foreheads, and they were surnamed Cyclopses, which means orb-eyed, because one orbed eye was set in their foreheads. Strength and might and craft were in their works. And again, um, three sons were born of earth and heaven, great and doughty beyond telling, Cadus and Briarius and Gyes, uh, presumptuous children. From their shoulders sprang a hundred arms, not to be approached, and each had fifty heads upon his shoulders on their strong limbs, and irresistible was the stubborn strength that was in their great forms. For all the children that were born of earth and heaven, these were the most terrible, and they were hated by their own father from the first, and he used to hide them all away in a secret place of earth so soon as each was born, and would not suffer them to come up into the light. And heaven rejoiced them in his evil doing, but vast earth groaned within, being straitened, and she thought a crafty and evil while. Forthwith she made the element of gray flint and shaped a great sickle, and told her plan to her dear sons, and she spoke cheering them while she was vexed in her dear heart. So this part, um, in the version I read originally in college and the way I was taught is that um these these uh these um these children with hundreds hand a hundred hands and fifty heads um like terrify Uranos and they think he thinks they're too powerful and they're gonna um overthrow him and he's losing his he's gonna lose his power. So um I think the version I read was much more um graphic in that it says in this one that he hides them away in a secret place of earth as soon as each was born um in the original reading i read basically uranos shoves them back in gaia's womb and refuses to let them be born um and so they're all like stuck in there and then gaia makes the sickle and asks like who who will punish your father um here's what she says my children, gotten of a sinful father, if you will obey me, we should punish the vile outrage of your father, for he first thought of doing shameful things. So, she said, but fear seized them all, and none of them uttered a word. But great Kronos, the wily, took courage and answered his dear mother, Mother, I will undertake to do this deed, for I reverence not our father of evil name, for he first thought of doing shameful things. Um, so I got the shameful thing is like not letting your children being born. Um, also in the account I read, it's not clear that, um, this relationship Gaia and Uranos have is consensual. Um, it's possible that rape is involved in this relationship. It's also incestual because Uranos is Gaia's son. Um, but technically, uh, Aphrodite, the goddess of desire, doesn't exist yet. So this is Eros, the goddess of love, has been born. But that is really, in most interpretations, it's just a, a urge to reproduce. That's a necessary urge of the universe. So um, incest is questionable here. It might not be like literally not be possible at this like point in the creation of the universe. Um, but yeah, anyways, um, the shameful thing is probably hiding your children away, not letting them be born, um, could also be rape, possibly incest, depending on your interpretation. Um, so, okay, moving on. So he said, and vast earth rejoiced greatly in spirit and set and hid him in an ambush 
and put in his hands a jagged sickle, and revealed to him the whole plot. And heaven came, bringing on night, and longing for love, and he lay about earth, spreading himself full upon her. Then the sun from his ambush stretched forth his left hand, and in his right took the great long sickle with jagged teeth, and swiftly lopped off his own father's members and cast them away to fall behind him. So Kronos has just castrated his father, Uranos, which means he cut off his his genitals, his penis, and his testicles. Um, essentially, the way you can picture this is Kronos is hiding in the womb when Uranos comes to um, have sex with Gaia and when <laughs> when the genitals go in there he cuts them off um, that's pretty much what is happening that's what I interpret it as and let me keep going and not vainly did they fall from his hand for all the bloody drops that gushed from earth received and as the seasons moved around she bare the strong Erinys and the great giants with gleaming armor, holding long spears in their hands, and the nymphs who they call Melie, all over the boundless earth. So the blood drops fall to the earth, and new gods are born. Um, and so soon as he had cut off the members with flint and cast them from the land into the surging sea, so the testicles land in the sea, they were swept away from the main a long time, and a white foam spread around them from the immortal flesh, and in it there grew a maiden. First she drew near holy Cythera, and from there afterwards she came to secret Cyprus, and came forth an awful and lovely goddess, and grass grew up about her, but up about her beneath her shapely feet. Her, her gods and men call Aphrodite, and the foam-born goddess and rich crown Cytheria, because, uh, let me start again. And the foam-born goddess and rich, and rich crowned Cytheria, because she grew amid the foam, and Cytheria, because she reached Cytheria and Cyprogenes, because she was born in billowy Cyprus and Philomades, because because she sprang from the members. So she has a bunch of different names, basically, because the she was born in a bunch of places. Okay. And with her went Eros, and comely desire followed her at birth, and at the first, and as she went into the assembly of the gods. This honor she has from the beginning, and this is the portion allotted to her uh, amongst men and undying gods. The whisperings of maidens and smiles and deceits with sweet delight and love and graciousness. Uh, but these sons whom he begot himself, great Uranos used to call titans, which also means strainers or overreachers, in reproach, for he said that they strained and did presumptuously a fearful deed, and that vengeance for it would come afterwards. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to read this part too. And night bear hateful doom and black fate and death, and she bear sleep in the tribe of dreams. And again, the goddess, murky night, though she lay with none, bear blame and painful woe. And the Hesperides, who guard the rich golden apples in the tree, bearing fruits <coughs> beyond glorious ocean. Also, she bear the destinies and ruthless avenging fates, Clotho and Lachesis and Atropos, who give men at their birth both evil and good to have, and they pursue the transgressions of men and of gods. And these goddesses never cease from their dread anger until they punish the sinner with a sore penalty. Also, deadly night bear nemesis, also means indignation, to afflict mortal men and after her deceit and friendship and hateful age and hard-hearted strife. Um, let me see. But abhorred strife bear painful toll and forgetfulness and famine and tearful sorrows, Fightings also, battles, murders, manslaughters, quarrels, lying, words, disputes, lawlessness, and ruin. All of one mature, sorry, all of one nature and oath who must troubles, who most troubles men upon earth when anyone willfully swears a false oath. Okay, let me check my notes because I'm going to skip this part. Um... Okay, I'm gonna skipping, skipping. This is 
This is just uh, about all the people who were born from the sea. Um, okay. And in a hollow cave, um, she bare another monster, irresistible, in no wise like either to mortal men or to the undying gods, even the goddess fierce Echidna, who is half a nymph with glancing eyes and fair cheeks, and half again a huge snake, great and awful, with speckled skin, eating raw flesh beneath the secret parts of the holy earth. And there she has a cave deep down under a hollow rock, far from the deathless gods and mortal men. There then did the gods appoint her a glorious house to dwell in, and she keeps guard in Arima, beneath the earth, grim Echidna, a nymph who dies not, nor grows old all her days. Men say that Typhon the Terrible, outrageous, outrageous and lawless, was joined in love to her, the maid with glancing eyes. She conceived and brought forth fierce offspring, First she bare Orthus, the hound of Geryanes, and then again she bare a second, a monster not to be overcome and that may not be described, Cerberus, who eats raw flesh, the voiced hound, the voiced hound of Hades, fifty-headed, relentless, and strong. And she again, and again she bore a third, the evil-minded Hydra of Lerna, whom the goddess white-armed Hera nourished, being angry beyond measure with the mighty Heracles, and her Heracles, the son of Zeus, of the house of Amphitryon, together with the warlike Aeolus, destroyed with the unpitying sword uh, through the plans of Athene, the spoiled driver. Uh, she was the mother of Chimera, who breathed raging fire, a cr creature fearful, great, swift-footed, and strong, who had three heads, one of a grim lion, another, <coughs> another of a goat, and another of a snake, a fierce dragon in her forepart. Uh, she was a lion in her, hind her hinder part, uh, a dragon, and in her middle, a goat, breathing forth a fearful blast of blazing fire. Her did Pegasus and noble... Bellerophon <laughs> slay, but Echidna was subject in love to Orthus and brought forth the deadly Sphinx, which destroyed the Cadmians and the Nemean lion, which Hera, the good, wa the good wife of Zeus, brought up and made to haunt the hills of Nemea, a plague to men. There he preyed upon the tribes of her own people and had power over Tretus and Nemea and Epesus, yet the strength of stout Heracles overcame him. Okay, I'm skipping another part. I wanted to read that part about the monsters. I'm skipping to 105 a little bit. Um, no, I'm skipping past 105. I'm sorry. I'm skipping to 113 um, down here to the part where but Rhea was subject in love to Kronos. Let me take a drink of water. Let me wipe my eyes for my allergies, um, and then I'll be back. I can see better. <coughs> okay. <coughs> but Rhea was subject in love to Kronos, and bare splendid children. Hestia, Demeter, and gold-shod Hera, and strong Hades, pitiless in heart, who dwells under the earth, and the loud crashing earth shaker, and wise Zeus, father of gods and men, by whose thunder the wide earth is shaken. These great Kronos swallowed as each came from the womb to his mother's knees with this intent, that no other of the proud sons of heaven should hold the kingly office amongst the deathless gods. So as his children are being born, Kronos is swallowing them. For Kronos learned from Earth and starry Uranos that he was destined to be overcome by his own son, strong though he was through the contriving of great Zeus. So um, Gaia and Uranos, Kronos' parents, tell Kronos a prophecy that Zeus will overthrow him. Therefore he kept no blind outlook, but watched and swallowed down his children. An unceasing grief seized Rhea, or Rhea, 
But then, but when she was about to bear Zeus, the father of gods and men, then she besought her own dear parents, Gaia and starry Uranus, to devise some plan with her that the birth of her dear child might be concealed, and that retribution might overtake great crafty Kronos for his own father, and also for the children whom he swallowed down. And they readily heard and obeyed their dear daughter, and told her all that was destined to happen touching Kronos, the king, and his stout-hearted son. So they went. So they sent her to Lyctus, to the rich land of Crete, where she was ready to bear great Zeus, the youngest of her children. Who, him did vast Gaia receive from Rhea in wide Crete to nourish and to bring up. So Gaia raises Zeus secretly. Thither came Earth, carrying him swiftly through the black night of Lyctus first, and took him in her arms and hid him in a remote cave beneath the secret places of the Earth, on the thick wooded Mount Aegeum. But to the mighty sorry, but to the mightily ruling son of heaven, Kronos, the early king earlier king of the gods, she gave a great stone wrapped in swaddling clothes. So instead of giving her Zeus the baby, um, I'm sorry, instead of Rhea like giving Kronos Zeus to swallow, she gives him a stone that's wrapped in baby's that is wrapped in baby's clothes. Kronos took it in his hands and thrust it down into his belly. Wretch! He knew not in his heart that in place of the stone his son was left behind, unconquered and untroubled, and that he was soon to overcome him by force and might and drive him from his honors, himself to reign over the deathless gods. After that, the strength and glorious limbs of the prince increased quickly, and as the years rolled on, great Kronos the wily was beguiled by the deep suggestions of earth and brought up again his offspring. Uh, vanished by the anqu- So uh, Gaia tricks him to throw up his children. <laughs> uh, vanquished by the arts and might of his own son, and he vomited up first the stone which he had swallowed last, and Zeus set it fast in the wide path earth at goodly Pytho, under the glens of Parnassus, to be a sign thenceforth and a marvel to mortal men. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he set forth from their deadly bonds the brothers of his father, sons of heaven from his father in foolishness, uh, who sons of heaven whom his father in his foolishness had bound, and they remembered to be grateful to him for his kindness and gave him thunder and glowing thunderbolt and lightning, for before that huge earth had hidden these. In them he trusts and rules over mortals and immortals. So what I just read is another like prophecy uh, section that some people cut out because it just tells you what's going to happen. Um, so I'm skipping a little bit more. Um... Let me see. No, wait, I'm sorry, I'm not skipping more. This is going to be about Prometheus. Okay. Now, Iapetus took to his wife the knee, the knee ankled maid Clymene, daughter of Ocean, and met up with her in, into one bed. And she bare him a stout hearted son, Atlas. Also, she bare very glorious Minotius and clever Prometheus, full of various wiles and scatter brained uh, Epimetheus who from the first was a mischief to men who ate bread, for it was he who first took of Zeus the woman, the maiden whom he had formed. Okay, that's about, um, that's about Pandora. Um, but Menotius was outrageous, and far-seeing Zeus struck him with a lurid thunderbolt and sent him down to Erebus because of his mad presumption and exceeding pride. And Atlas, through hard constraint, upholds the wide heaven with unwearying head and arms, standing at the borders of the earth before the clear-voiced Hesperides. For this light, for this lot, why Zeus assigned to him, and ready-witted Prometheus, he bound with an inextricable bonds, cruel chains, and drove a shaft through his middle, and set on him a long-winged eagle, which used to eat his immortal liver. But by night the liver grew as much again every way as the long-winged bird devoured it in the whole day. That bird, Heracles the Valiant, son of shapely-ankled uh, Alcmene, slew and delivered the son of Iapetus from the cruel plague. So Heracles 
saves Prometheus, uh, released Prometheus from his affliction. Not without the will of Olympian Zeus, who reigns on high, that the glory of Heracles the Theban born might be yet greater than it was before over the plenteous earth. This then he regarded and honored his famous son. Though he was angry, he ceased from the wrath which he had before, because Prometheus matched himself in wit with the almighty son of Kronos. For when the gods and immortal men had a dispute at Mekone, even then Prometheus was forward to cut up a great ox and set portions before them, trying to befool the mind of Zeus. So they have this feast, and Prometheus cuts up the ox and... Zeus is supposed to get the best parts, but uh, Prometheus uh, hides the best parts under fat and hides the bones under some of the guts and has tries to trick Zeus into choosing the bones. Um, so let's see what happens. Before the rest, he set flesh and inner parts thick with fat upon the hide, covering them with an ox pouch, paunch. But for Zeus, he cut the white bones dressed up with cunning art and covered with shining fat. Then the father of men and of God said to him, Son of Iepetus, most glorious of all gods, most glorious of all lords, good sir, how unfairly you have divided the portions. So said Zeus, whose wisdom is everlasting, rebuking him, but wily Prometheus answered him, smiling softly and not forgetting his cunning trick. Zeus, most glorious and greatest of the eternal gods, take whichever of these portions your heart within you bids. So, he said, thinking trickery. But Zeus, whose wisdom is everlasting, saw and failed not to perceive the trick. And in his heart he thought mischief against mortal men, which also was to be fulfilled. With both hands he took up the white fat and was angry at heart. And wrath came to his spirit when he saw the white ox bones craftily tricked out. And because of this, the tribes of men upon uh, earth burn white bones to the deathless gods upon fragrant altar altars. But Zeus, who drives the clouds, was greatly vexed and said to him, Son of Iepetus, clear, clever above all. So, sir, you have not yet forgotten your cunning arts. So this whole Prometheus thing with the bones and the fat is just like a little like tale to explain like why the ancient Greeks burn white bones at the altars of Zeus. Um, but also, it's about trickery and disrespecting authority and that kind of stuff. So spake Zeus in anger, whose wisdom is everlasting. And from the time he was always mindful of the trick and would not give the power of unwearying fire to the Milian race. So because of this trick, Zeus refuses to give fire to humans. Um, but the noble son of Iepetus, that's Prometheus, outwitted him and stole the far-seen gleam of unwearying fire in a hollow fennel stalk. So Prometheus steals fire, and Zeus, who thunders on high, was stung in spirit, and his dear heart was angered when he saw amongst men the far-seen ray of fire. Forthwith he made an evil thing for men as the price of fire. For the very famous limping god formed of earth the likeness of a shy maiden as the son of Kronos willed. So, in punishment to men having fire, this is really sexist. Um, god uh, Zeus creates women out of earth and makes them evil, uh, allegedly. Um, I'm going to read it. Um, and the goddess bright-eyed Athene girded and clothed her with silvery raiment. This is Pandora. Pandora is the first woman. And down from her head she spread with her hands a broidered veil, a wonder to see. And she, Pallas Athene, uh, that's Athena, put about her head lovely garlands, flowers of new-grown herbs. <clears throat> also she put on her head a crown of gold, which the very famous limping god made himself and worked with his own hands as a favor to Zeus his father. On it was much curious work, wonderful to see, for of the many creatures which the land and sea rear up, he put most upon it, wonderful things, like living beings with voices, and great beauty shone from it. But when he had made the beautiful evil to be the price for the blessing, he brought her out, delighting in the finery which the bright-eyed daughter of a mighty father had given her, to the place where the other gods and men were. And wonder took hold of the deathless gods and mortal men when they saw that 
when they saw that which was sheer guile, not to be withstood by men. For, for from her is the race of women and female kind. Of her is the deadly race and tribe of women who live amongst mortal men to their great trouble. No help meets in hateful poverty, but only in wealth. And as in thatched hive bees feed the drones whose nature is to do mischief, by day and throughout the day until the sun goes down, the bees are busy and lay the white combs, while the drones stay at home in the covered skeps and reap the toil of others into their bodies. Even so, Zeus, who thunders on high, made women to be an evil to mortal men with a nature to do evil. So that's that's Hesiod's view on women. Um, uh, I mean, he might just be telling the story um, because he is a poet, and uh, the story does have different versions, but that's the version in this one, which is not great, to say the least. Um, <laughs> I think he got dumped. Yeah, it could be. Um, okay. Um, let me see. Um, am I reading this part? Yeah, I think I'm reading this part. Okay. I'm reading here, uh, uh, 125 ish. But when first their father was vexed in his heart with Obriarius and Cadus and Gyes, these are the hundred handers with 50 heads, um, um, he bound them in cruel bonds. So this is when Uranus. Uh, they all got out of the womb, but Uranus um, bound the hundred handers and hid them away still. Because Uranus was jealous of their exceeding manhood and comeliness and great size, and he made them live beneath the wide path earth where they were afflicted, being set to dwell under the ground at the end of the earth, at its great borders, in bitter anguish for a long time, with great grief at heart. But the son of Kronos... Uh, Zeus and the other deathless gods whom rich-haired Rhea bare from their union with Kronos brought them up again so Zeus frees the hundred handers <coughs> to the light at earth's advising because Gaia tells him to for she herself recounted all things to the gods fully how that with these they would gain victory and a glorious cause to vaunt themselves so with the hundred handers they can defeat Kronos is what Gaia is saying for the Titan gods and as many as sprang from Kronos had long been fighting together in stubborn war with heart grieving toil the lordly Titans from high Othrys, but the gods rivers of good whom rich haired Rhea bear in union from with Kronos from Olympus so the Titans are fighting all the time those are the original um, those are the sons of Gaia and Uranus and the gods want them to stop um so they with bitter wrath were fighting continually with one another at that time for ten full years the titans were fighting and the hard strife had no close or end for either side and the issue of the war hung heavenly hung evenly balanced i'm sorry this is the gods and the titans fighting each other for ten years so then Gaia's finally like get the hundred handers out they'll help you but when he had provided those three with all things fitting, nectar and ambrosia, which the gods themselves eat, and when their proud spirit revived <coughs> within them, all after they had fed on nectar and delicious ambrosia, then it was that the father of men and God spoke among them. So they have a feast. God gives the hun Zeus gives the hundred handers nectar and ambrosia, and then he says this to them. Hear me, bright children of earth and heaven, that I might say what my heart within me bids. A long while now have we who are sprung from Kronos and the Titan gods fought with each other every day to get victory and to prevail. But do you show your great might and unconquerable strength and face the Titans in bitter strife? For remember our friendly kindness and from what sufferings you are come back to the light from your cruel bond cruel bondage under misty gloom through our counsels. 
So he said, and blameless Codus answered him again, Divine one, you speak that which we know well. Nay, even of ourselves we know that your wisdom and understanding is exceeding, and that you became a defender of the deathless ones from chill doom. And through your devising we, c we are come back again from the murky gloom and from our merciless bonds, enjoying what we looked not for. O Lord, son of Kronos, and so now with fixed purpose and deliberate counsel we will aid your power in dreadful strife and will fight against the titans in hard battle. So he said, and the gods, giver of, of good things, applauded him, applauded when they heard his word, and their spirit longed for war even more than before, and they all, both male and female, stirred up hated battle that day. The titan gods and all that was born of Kronos together with those dread mighty ones of overwhelming strength, whom Zeus brought up to the light from Erebus beneath the earth. And a hundred arms sprang from the shoulders of all alike, and each had fifty heads growing upon his shoulders upon stout limbs. These then stood against the titans in grim strife, holding huge rocks in their strong hands, and on the other part the titans eagerly straightened their, strengthened their ranks. Both sides at one time showed the works of their hands and their might. The boundless sea rang terribly around, and the earth crashed loudly. Wide Uranos was shaken and groaned, and high Olympus reeled from its foundation under the charge of the undying gods. And a heavy quaking reached dim Tartarus, and the deep sound of their feet, and the fearful onset of their hard missiles. So, then, they launched their grievous shafts upon one another, and the cry of both armies, as they shouted, reached to starry heaven, and they met together with a great battle cry. Then Zeus no longer held back his might, but straight his heart was filled with fury, and he showed forth all his strength. From heaven and from Olympus he came forth with, hurling his lightning. The bolts flew thick and fast from his strong hand, together with thunder and lightning, whirling an awesome flame. The life-giving earth crashed around and burning, and the vast wood crackled loud with fire all about. All the land seethed, and oceans streamed, oceans, streams, and the unfruitful sea. The hot vapor lapped around the earth-born titans. Flames unspeakable rose to the bright upper air. The flashing glare of the thunderstone and lightning blinded their eyes from all that they were strong. For all that they were strong. Astounding heat seized Chaos, and to see with eyes and to hear the sound with ears, it seemed as if earth and wide heaven above came together, for such a mighty crash would have risen <coughs> if earth were being hurled to ruin, and heaven from on high were hurling her down. So, God, so great a crash was there while the gods were meeting together in strife. Also the winds brought rumbling, earthquake, and dust storms, thunder and lightning, and the lurid thunderbolt which are the shafts of great Zeus, and carried the clangor and the war cry into the midst of the two hosts. A horrible uproar of terror, of terrible strife arose. Mighty deeds were shown, and the battle inclined, but until then they kept at one another and fought continually in cruel war. <clears throat> and amongst the foremost, Cadus and Briarios and Gais, Insatiate for war, raised fierce fighting, three hundred rocks, one upon another. They launched from their strong hands and overshadowed the titans with their missiles, and hurled them beneath the wide-pathed earth, and bound them in bitter chains when they had conquered them by their strength for all their great spirit, as far beneath the earth as heaven is above earth, for so far is it from earth to Tartarus. So... Um, the hundred handers defeat the Titans and they take them down to Tartarus, which is like way, 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 way down beneath, beneath the earth. And they, they chain them up for a brazen anvil falling down from heaven. Nine nights and days would reach the earth upon the 10th. And again, a brazen anvil falling from earth. Nine nights, nine nights and days would reach Tartarus upon the 10th. So if you dropped an anvil from space, it'd take like 20 days to reach Tartarus or something. Round, round it runs a fence of bronze, and night spreads in triple line all about it like a neck circlet, while above grow the roots of the earth and unfruitful sea. So they put a, uh, this bronze fence around the titans. There, by the counsel of Zeus, who drives the clouds of the, 
the titan gods are hidden underneath misty gloom in a dark in a dank place where are the ends of the huge earth and they may not and they may not go out for poseidon fixed gates of bronze upon it and a wall runs all around it on every side there guys and Cottus and great souled obriris live trusty warders of zeus who holds the aegis okay um and there i'm gonna skip a part in a minute and there all in their order are the sources and ends of gloomy earth and misty tartarus and the unfruitful sea and starry heaven loathsome and dank which even the gods abhor it is a great gulf and if once a man were within the gates he would not reach the floor until a whole year had reached its end okay it takes a year to get to tartarus um, but cruel blast upon blast would carry him this way and that, and this marvel is awful even to the deathly gods. So Tartarus sucks. It's really far away. That's the long and short of that. Um, I'm going to skip 135 to 139. Where am I starting? Let me look at my notes. Um, okay, here. <clears throat> but when Zeus had driven the Titans from heaven, huge earth bare her youngest child Typhoeus, for the love of the love of Tartarus, by the aid of golden Aphrodite. Strength was with his hands in all that he did, and the feet of the strong god were untiring. From his shoulders grew a hundred heads of a snake, a fearful dragon with dark flickering tongues, and from under the brow of his eyes and his marvelous heads flashed fire. And fire burned from his heads as he glared, and there were voices in all his dreadful hands, in all his dreadful heads, which uttered every kind of sound unspeakable. For at one time they made sounds such that the gods understood, but at another, the noise of a bull bellowing aloud in proud, ungovernable fury, and at another, the sound of a lion relentless of heart, and at another, sounds like whelps wonderful to hear, and again, at another, he would hiss so that the high mountains re-echoed. So this dude, uh, Typhoeus, is like a terrible monster that makes a bunch of crazy sounds, has a bunch of different heads and shit. Um, and, truly, and truly, a thing past help would have happened on that day, and he would have come to reign over mortals and immortals, had not the father of men and gods been quick to perceive it. But he thundered hard and mightily, and the earth around resounded terribly, and the wide heaven above, and the sea, and oceans, streams, and the nether parts of the earth. Great Olympus reeled beneath the divine feet of the king as he arose, and earth groaned thereat. And through the two of them, uh, heat took hold on the dark blue sea, through the thunder and lightning, and through the fire from the monster, and the scorching winds and blazing thunderbolt. The whole earth seethed, and the sky and sea and the long waves raged along the beaches round and about at the rush of the deathless gods, and there arose an endless shaking. Hades trembled where he rules over the dead below, and the titans under Tartarus who live with Kronos because of the unending clamor and the fearful strife. So when Zeus had raised up his might and seized his arms, thunder and lightning and lurid thunderbolt, he leaped from Olympus and struck uh, this... This dude, Typhoeus, um, leaps from Olympus. Uh, shit, now I lost my place. <laughs> oh, no. So he leaped from Olympus and struck him and burned all the marvelous heads of the monster about him. But when Zeus had conquered him and lashed him with strokes, Typhoeus was hurled down a maimed wreck so that the huge earth groaned. And flame shot forth from the thunder-stricken lord in the dim rugged glens of the mount when he was smitten a great part of huge earth was scorched by the terrible vapor and melted as tin melts when heated by men's art in channeled crucibles okay so so zeus fucks up typhoeus um next um is the last part and then i'll be done reading and it hasn't been an hour wow i thought this would take forever okay now Zeus, king of the gods, made Metis his wife first, and she was wisest among gods and mortal men. Okay, in some, in some versions, um, Zeus pesters Metis a lot, turns into a bunch of animals to stalk her, and eventually rapes her. 
Um, in this version, this does not happen. Um, he somehow gets her pregnant. I mean, not somehow. He gets her pregnant, and then you'll see what happens. Um, there's a lot of debate about different versions, what happens between Zeus and Metis. Um, he does deceive her, though, which is not cool, which I'm about to read. But when she was about to bring forth the goddess bright-eyed Athene, uh, Zeus and Metis have Athena as their child. Zeus craftily deceived her with cunning words and put her in his own belly. So Zeus swallows Metis. Um, let me see. Uh, okay. I'm gonna... And then it talks about his other wives. And then um, I'll tell you... You'll find out why um, Zeus swallowed Metis. I'm just gonna read it. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Zeus, with his cunning words, he put her in his own belly as earth and starry heaven advised. For they advised him so to the end that no other should hold royal sway over the eternal gods in place of Zeus. For very wise children were destined to be born of her, first the maiden, bright-eyed Tritogenia, that's another name for Athena, equal to her father in strength and in wise understanding, but afterwards she was to bear a son of overbearing spirit, kings of God and men. But Zeus put her into his own belly first, that the goddess might devise for him both good and evil. So, basically the same thing. Kronos was told by his parents that a child would be born that would overthrow him. Zeus is told by Gaia and Uranus that Athena will have a child who will overthrow him. Or will challenge his royal rule. Um... So I'm going to skip to the part where Athena is born, because it's interesting. Um, lastly, he made Hera his blooming wife. That's his, that's his like, real wife, everybody knows. And he cheats on Hera a lot, of course. She was joined in love with the king of gods and men and brought forth Hebe and Ares and Ileithia. Uh, didn't practice that one. Okay, here it is. But Zeus himself gave birth from his own head to bright-eyed Tritogenia, that is Athena, the awful, the strife-stirring, the host leader, the unwearing, the queen, for whom who delights in tumults and wars and battles. But Hera, without union with Zeus, for she was very angry and quarreled with her mate, bare famous Hephaestus, who was skilled in crafts more than all sons of heaven. So... Zeus swallows Metis, and then before he swallowed Metis, he got her pregnant. So then, um, so then the baby still comes out, but it comes out of Zeus's head, out of his forehead. In another version, Hephaestus, the goddess of, god of craftsmen, or another god, uh, they crack open his skull with a chisel, and Athena just pops out, like, full grown in an armor. Um, the queen, it's not the queen, um, Hera is the queen, Hera is Zeus's wife, um, Athena is Zeus's daughter, she is the goddess of wisdom, um, and sometimes kind of of war, she, like, gives men courage in war, she always has armor on, and she's very strong, so this, this is like, this is what breaks up the, the cycle of uh, power transferring because somehow um, the the birthing prophecy that like your your children will have a son or you will have a son who will uh, overthrow you like Zeus swallows him swallows Metis and instead of being a normal birth um, Athena comes out of Zeus's head which makes her the goddess of wisdom and so somehow this is a way in mythological uh reasoning to like stop the 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 overthrowing prophecy i not quite sure i haven't reasoned it out all the way um yeah that's actually it essentially there's more about more people who are born um yeah, uh, I hope that went okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pee and take a little break, um, cause that was a lot of reading for me.
and then I will be right back. Um, okay, little break. Thanks, don't go anywhere. I'm gonna be back with interpretations. We're gonna do discussions. Um, Okay, um, Sansa asked, um, it's not a stupid question. If you don't know much about um, ancient poetry or ancient Greek society, you wouldn't know. Um, until, until the philosophers of Plato and pre-Socratic philosophers... Um, Everything was part of an oral tradition. Um, that is a lot of ancient societies, especially ancient Greece. So um, this wasn't written originally till a long time ago. I can't remember the year. It was like third century or something. Um, till it was like found somewhere, written down, and like translated and stuff. Um, so this poem would have like rhymed. There would have been singing in it likely and um uh and um shit <laughs> hesiod would have had it all memorized it wouldn't have been written down and this would have been something that he would have done at like a performance on a stage possibly at a competition to see um who could honor the gods more or would get more fanfare from the audience um it's actually pretty interesting because a lot of these myths, like they mention, um, this isn't the whole, this isn't the whole theogony. This is the part that a lot of people know, but, um, uh, so it's like Greece. Yeah, I guess so. Maybe, um, um, Pandora has a lot of different versions. Prometheus has some slightly different versions. So these are the versions that, um, Hesiod would have collected and gathered together and told the version that he thought was appropriate, uh, the version that he liked the best. Um, and this, this kind of like poem would have been passed down for generations, um, from just people learning it and memorizing it and telling it over and over again, because they have like no other stories to tell. I mean, they have lots of stories to tell, but this one was pretty important. Um, yeah, great question. Um, so, um, 
Okay, my first discussion topic, um, which I'm going to lecture on for a bit, is uh, Hesiod's notion of the RK as chaos, or chaos. Um, so this is something that I is really important to the reading in terms of philosophy. And something that leads heavily into the pre-Socratics, um, pre-Socratic philosophers and Plato. <coughs> um, so it's really important to know what this chaos thing kind of is, although it's really hard to say what it is. Um, so it really happens super quickly. Like they just say like at first there was chaos and then they just move on. But, um, it's really important for how philosophers try to think about existence and being um, because chaos is not just one thing. It's translated typically as abyss. Um, and so the what I said earlier was about chaos being the RK. RK is, is origin um, in, in ancient Greek and what the pre-Socratics, the first philosophers look for is like, what is the universal origin of everything? So they'll like say it was water or it was air or fire and um, stuff like that. And they'll like argue back and forth about that. But um, as having chaos as the origin point, having an abyss as an origin point, just a giant hole that is, is a thing, but also not a thing. Chaos is the beginning of everything is being and non-being at the same time, um, which is, which is huge. Um, because it's, it's different from the Christian tradition where there's just one om omnipotent God without origin who creates ex nihilo. They create, he creates everything out of nothing. Um, they're, it, with God, it's just like God is just being. There's nothing, there's no way to explain non being in, there's no absence in the Christian tradition. Um, chaos is just the substance that is a plurality. Instead of being, instead of being this one singular being like God, I mean, God is infinite, but also God is, has like almost nothing to do with non being in the Christian tradition. Chaos is at an abyss that is at the same time being and non-being. Um, uh, so, in modern philosophy, in modern philosophy, this would be termed the condition or the possibility for existence. Um, chaos is the ancient Greek infinite paradoxical state of the universe. Even as other beings, titans, monsters, gods, elements, and humans come into being, chaos is is the basis of existence, is the whole background. You cannot exist without it. You cannot exist uh, outside of it. Um, chaos is time and space and being and non-being. And without it, there is, there's no movement, there's no conflict, there's no life or death. Um, with chaos as the origin point, existence itself is a paradox. Um, nothing in this life is ever resolved. Everything moves in between being and non-being and the conflicts that arise from these. Um, there is no... So, in in terms of chaos, this is something that the ancient Greeks have to... They literally believe it. Like, this isn't just some sort of metaphor. This is something that determines the way that they think, the way that they behave, the way that they talk the way that they think about their lives and their existence. Um, so for them, they're, it's really hard for them to believe that there is one truth, there's no purity, there's no one anything. Everything is mixed, everything is a plurality, um, and everything is a, connected in a world of subjects and relationships, um, which is another topic I'm gonna talk about. But essentially to say, everything's mixed together, everything's connected, uh, the gods all are related uh, through some sort of relationship by birth or genealogy. Um, so everything depends profoundly on each other to exist. Um, so saying like, 
I don't know. What I'm trying to say is kind of bold because it can be disproven and it what my claim kind of disproves itself because Hesiod himself tries to like universalize everything. He tries to compartmentalize everything. The ocean, sorrow, strife, the sky, earth, everything has a name. Everything has its place and a connection. Um, and his, his theology like spawns the first philosophers and, uh, they seriously try and find like the origin point, a material origin point of the real world. Um, and I'm going to talk about them next week. Uh, so even if I, even as I try to like say what chaos is, like I try to say what it is, try to define it. Um, (laughs) Even as I try to define it, um, it falls apart because you can't say what chaos is because it's not just one thing. It's an abyss of creation that's also a substance that contains being and non-being. Um, so it can't just be one thing. Like I say it's those things, but it's always more than one. So if you try to give it like one definition, like all those things I said it is, it is all those things, but it's not just one thing. Um, so it shows you how like how um, how genius it is for the RK to be like that because life is and philosophy are so complicated because it's not just oh there was some god um, and he created stuff. It's it's not just it's and then that's it um, because that that is just like okay where did god come from and of course you can ask where chaos comes from but um chaos chaos is just like it doesn't need an origin point as much because like where did the being of god come from if there was nothing before it um this is being and non-being and time and space like all like wrapped into one um uh so I think that it's fascinating and it's really important for the ancient Greeks, um, how they view philosophy and how they tackle it. Um, so, so yeah, lots of interpretations about chaos are like equally valid, logically speaking, but they, there's not just one correct ultimate interpretation because of the paradoxical existence of chaos and the existence you have within chaos um chaos is one interpretation and all of them at the same time um attempting to define it and hold it in a universal definition is not possible because it's always a plurality it's always more than one um the movement between the one definition and interpretation and the many other definitions is primarily called dialectical thinking it's best practiced and illustrated by Plato's dialogues uh, featuring Socrates. I'm not going to delve too deeply into this, uh, Plato and Socrates, right now, because that's going to be for in a couple weeks. Um, I'm only to, trying to show like how chaos as the condition of existence in ancient Greek thought influences the philosophers who follow. So... It's going to totally influence how Socrates does his whole method. It's going to influence the main goal of every pre-Socratic, um, uh, pre-Platonic philosopher to follow, um, which I'll do next week. Um, I do have a side note about this topic. Um, I think it's only fair to acknowledge the Christian tradition to separate them from the Abrahamic tradition. I was reading about it some um, in the Torah, which lots of people call Genesis, which is kind of similar but has different translations. There is a chaos, chaos-like chaos moment prior to God, which the Hebrew word translates as darkness or confusion. Um, so there is like a chaos-type moment before um, God exists in the Hebrew tradition, but Christian scholars on the whole do not accept the translation because nothing can come before God. But many Jewish Jewish scholars um, are more open to accepting this earlier kind of state uh, that came before Chaos. Um, 
and there are there are lots of other cosmologies like Babylonian and Hawaiian and um, uh, there was another one I can't remember right now lots of cosmologies and theologies have this sort of like dark uh, mixed confusion state before there's like uh, some kind of reproductive element that allows the world to begin or before there's some kind of appearance of a god or something like that um so i do think that's interesting and i am kind of curious about other um other traditions that have this that share these similarities these other these myths um okay uh that was my first topic that's the most important one um for what I'm going to be doing next week. Um, I did see some questions in the chat. Is this cows guy related to cows? Um, I'm not sure who cows is. Maybe I said cows wrong. Um, It is spelled like chaos, um, but it's pronounced cows in ancient Latin, whatever. makes so much more sense than the Christian God though, even with all the baby swallowing and genitals turning into goddesses. <clears throat> well, a lot of it, if you read it today with a different lens is metaphorical. Um, babies, it's like, it's like, um, I mean, they do incredible things. They're gods. So like, it's more like trapping them, trying to contain them, putting them in prison so that, um, so that they don't, overthrow you because you're paranoid about your power you're you're obsessed with it because you're like in this patriarchal uh position and um it's if you read it into the society's culture um it's very relevant and makes sense um the the genitals turning into the goddesses uh myths always have these weird logical um swings that they take um the only thing that makes sense about it is that it turns into the goddess of desire which is uranos and gaia's whole relationship and um desire is it makes sense that it turns into aphrodite it doesn't just turn into like the god of the sun like um genitals and go together with desire 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 goes together with uranus's relationship with gaia um and the sea is like a giant womb you have to you have to like think in these weird mythological ways and make these connections to try and understand these kind of things that happen in myth like levi strauss studied this a lot and i learned about it some in my uh anthropo- anthropology class um you have to like try and think like them and make certain connections with uh, like different definitions. It's just interesting that the genitals that were possibly raping the earth turn into desire. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting (laughs) to say the least. Um, Let me read, let me read Paul's comment. It gets back to an idea of whether or not we created gods to explain things we couldn't explain or whether gods truly do these things. Yeah, um, well, I'm not going to say that's interesting, and it reminds me of uh, the Euthyphro, uh, like, do the gods like what they like, or do they just like what they say that they like, um, stuff like that, like, is it pious because the gods like it, or pious because we do it, and that's all that we know, um, uh i'm not gonna i don't believe in the gods i don't believe in any god personally um but i do think that lots of myths are symptomatic of the society that they were written within um and uh yeah i mean this is the war in the story the overthrowing of power through force which eventually leads zeus to put up this sort of more fair oligarchy slash maybe democratic republic not sure what it is at the end um that's that's all like that's all 
allegory for ancient Greek history, um, strife and conflict and war and multiple autocratic tyrants leading up to uh, like a democratic republic type deal. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all you can read it as like fantasy, but then you can also read it into the history and the culture. Um, yeah, to use Christianity, did God really flood the earth or was there just a bunch of rain that the people at the time had no explanation for? It's actually interesting. Um, the ancient Greeks had a lot of trouble with like, they thought the earth was going to dry up and, uh, also they thought it was going to flood because there was such like incredible, uh, like changes in the environment at the time that they were alive and they always lived on the sea and stuff. Um, and I went to Turkey to this ancient city of Miletus and it used to be right on the water. And I went and stood up there at the top of this ancient amphitheater and you couldn't see the water anymore. It used, it was built as a port city and now the water has receded all the way back to like where the Aegean Sea is now. And so some of the things that they do put in their in their in their like uh, predictions, their prophecies, and some of the things they do with their gods were like them actually, yes, trying to explain things they couldn't explain um, because like crazy shit was happening to them and they were like, we just have fire and sandals and spears. We don't fucking know why this is happening. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have any questions, like, about the first topic, um, about existence? Um, this is unrelated. You can come back to it later. I'm also interested in the obsession with your children being better than you. So you have to destroy them. Like what in Greek culture made that relatable or understandable? Or was it just something that God struggled with? I don't know. I am going to get back to it uh, in the last topic, sunset. In the When I talk about law and the rule of the father um, and the, the sort of patriarchy uh, that you see play out um, at the throughout like the whole um, structure of the myth, um, um, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to move on to the second topic. The second topic is about the appearances and how to judge, how to do judgment. Um, this also leads directly into Plato and is directly connected to Kaos's existence as a plurality, which we are trapped within if, if we're thinking with ancient Greek um, yes, true, Paul. Um, so this is about appearances, language, um, and plurality once again. Um, I'm going to read this quote that my, um, my professor liked to read at times. It's on line 81. Uh, let me go back to it here. I'm looking at my notes. It's what the muses first say. Um, we know we know how to speak many false things as though they were true, but we know when we will to utter true things. So this is also huge for Plato and appearances in ancient Greek philosophy, tragedy, and also poems, because you can see many times where... Uh, gods and characters are fooled by the appearances of things. So um, whether it's the stone that replaces Zeus and Kronos swallows it and he is tricked or it's Prometheus um, tricking Zeus, even though he saw through it because he's like Zeus and he can see everything. I'm not sure why Zeus still took the bones, but I guess cause he just wanted to punish Prometheus. Um, that's another appearances. Appearances and trickery, deception are associated with women in the text. And um, the muses give these prophecies, which is sort of this appearance level of events that are to come um, and events that will, will be. Um, 
that kind of thing. Uh, and if you ever read ancient Greek tragedy, there's always people disguised as things. Oedipus doesn't know to all, to all, like for all purposes. Um, <laughs> exactly. For all purposes, uh, Oedipus doesn't know that his mother, his wife is his mother and everything appears fine to him. And he thinks somebody is going to betray him, but then somebody else killed his father, but then he accidentally killed his own father and all this shit that is just appearances on appearances. And that's what they love to do with Greek tragedy tragedy. Um, <laughs> yeah, he is a motherfucker. So, uh, dealing with appearances of things versus things that actually are is really big for Plato in particular. The main examples which I read were about the muses, about truth and falsity, and the stone substitute and Prometheus's trick. Um, I'm not going to get too into it because it's a lot about Plato and tragedy. Are you familiar with the poem Ozymandias? Um, I'm familiar with the end of it. Um, I have not read it. Um, or am I thinking of something else? Is that the one where the lovers and one of them gets turned to stone at the end? Or is that another one with O? <laughs> Maybe I'm not. Um, but you can, you can comment on it more if feel free and I'll read it after I'm done reading my notes. Um, so I'm not going to get too into the, uh, appearances, but I will connect it back to Kaos. Um, the connection can be redundant, but it's a bit of an expansion on what I was talking about with dialectical thinking. Uh, judgment is really big for Greek philosophy and philosophy in general. Um, a large portion of the Platonic corpus is figuring out how we ought to judge truth from falsity. How can we obtain any level of certainty when we are surrounded by appearances and must question so much shit all the damn time? Um, well, that is why Plato Socrates follows a strict method of questioning so as to deal with the paradox of trying to pin down something's origin. That's what a lot of, I mean, philosophy, I mean, not postmodern philosophy, but a lot of philosophy for the whole history is trying to get this definition down, just try and say this one thing. And whenever you find out you can't do it because the ground of your definition always slips out from underneath you. It's not solid enough or you have the wrong argument. Your arguments always seem to fall apart. And according to the ancient Greeks, that's because that's the way the universe was created. We exist within, um, we exist within a, a substance, uh, a way of being that is, we're stuck in a paradoxical state. Everything is moving in time um, nothing is 100% certain. You can't access essences, um, like the essence of the thing. You want to know what, like, what justice is, but then everyone has a bunch of opinions and you can't figure out what it is. It's because chaos. It's because of the plurality, because your existence is in an absence. It's in a hole. Everything has a hole in it, okay? That, that is, that is the ancient Greek way of being um and that's why socrates in plato comes up with his socratic method to try legitimately try to come up with definitions um a great example is how difficult it is to get to origins is the difference in eyewitness accounts and memories like what actually happened that day in a certain event uh, an even bigger question which Plato Socrates tackles is where did language come from? There are many opinions and agreements are possible, but no final truth with a capital T is ever found. Um, he does that in the Cratylus. Um, all, all one can do when it comes to origins is just to speculate and follow some kind of logical path to a conclusion. And if that is not satisfying, try another one. Um, Philosophy means the love of knowledge. It literally means that. Like, philo is love in ancient Greek, and um, the rest of it is knowledge. Um, it is not an aggressive pursuit. Philosophy isn't this aggressive, like, well, the way I know philosophy, which is continental philosophy, not analytical philosophy, with the 
destructive, aggressive rhetoric um, philosophy to me and to how I learned it. It's not an aggressive pursuit where you just try, try to destroy everyone who has something to say, like Ben Shapiro or something. Rather, it's a process in which one grapples with a paradox, even knowing that no definitive end is possible. Kaos is all important in this regard because without accepting our condition, there is so much front frustration, dogmatism, and conflicts. Everyone's going to say, I have the truth. No, I have the truth. I mean, it's symptomatic of the country, of what happens when religions get in uh, conflicts with each other and arguments. Um, if you can accept that philosophy is about loving discussion, if you accept that philosophy is about love in general, it's not about hatred or disproving or going in to destroy your opponent. Um, it's about... It's about relationships, honestly. Um, it's about making the connections with people, with ideas. Um, it's about bettering yourself and your spirit. And um, it's so much more than like some like white dude with a ponytail in a college room like trying to slam everybody because he thinks he knows everything in the world. Um, so if you if you come to understand chaos and come to grips with it and accept it, it can help you resist the frustration and honestly the aggressive like rationalist posture that you can that you can come to like take up if you practice philosophy a lot um, because you're supposed to remember that it's a process and it's not about the goal. Um, so I want to expand here on a difficult subject that I just mentioned, not too much because it's really difficult. This subject is philosophy of language. Um, one of the great difficulties in, difficulties in philosophy is words. I mean this in two ways. One, philosophy has a ton of long, overcomplicated words and vocabulary. Um, everybody <laughs> knows that if you ever tried to interact with philosophy. Two, words are only placeholders for the existence of beings and stimuli in which one is relation in relation to. So words are just these things we invented to, um, to put a placeholder on something like headphones. These, this is, these aren't headphones does not totally describe this. It's got circles. It's got cushions. It's got like 20 different textures. It's got batteries. It has electrical wires running in it. It has this fucking yellow foam it has circuit boards, it has it has rubber, it has plastic, it has symbols on it, plus signs, brands. It's like, this is, just to say this is headphones is just so that we can do a customary thing and so that I can try and do a shortcut to communicate something to you. So words and languages are not, words and language are not the same thing. Um, so... I don't want to get too deep into this because it's incredibly complex and you can really fuck with your head. Um, however, I do think that the notion of language and artistic inspiration coming from the gods and as it does in the theogony, like all, that's why I read the beginning so much because like the ability to speak eloquently and get inspiration for art comes only from like the muses and the gods. Like language, language is, is not a human thing. Um, Language is, language comes from somewhere else. Language is something that we're within. And so when we do try and use words to do philosophy, we should be like aware of that, aware of our definitions, aware of uh, how our thinking informs what we're about to say and what we have knee-jerk reactions to when we respond to somebody in life or in a discussion. Um, so... It's really important in the theogony because of the connection to chaos, um, thinking and believing that words and language can reach the origin of any one thing or being can be really dangerous and it's a difficult problem for many philosophers. Um, muses are deceitful just like the language. It's true. It's true. That is exactly right. Um, thank you for saying that. Um, I don't think I need to convince anyone how dangerous words can be if you've ever been seriously insulted or 
if you've ever been like harassed or bullied or um, you can see how politicians go on TV and say dangerous things and people freak out and they react and, you know, all that kind of things and they do stupid stuff. Uh, the problem for philosophers really is that words are their bread and butter and yet at the same time they betray them. As I have already discussed, arguments turn back on you and fall apart. As, as soon as you try and make an ultimate conclusion, your argument somehow falls apart. Like I try and say, Kyle says this and this and this. And then someone will say, well, I think it's this. Or my argument itself will collapse in on itself because I can't say Kyle says just one thing. It's always multiple. It's like a series of interwoven and connected relationships that I'll never be able to fully explain with words. Um and yeah, I still can communicate it to you somehow um, with feelings, emotions, um, that kind of stuff. But words we know are inadequate to grasp and hold a universal definition for anything. Um, philosophy navigates its subject by words, but cannot lead one to a final destination. And as I was saying, that's not the goal. That's not what philosophy is about. Um, to put it in short terms, language is communication itself everything around us communicates different shapes colors textures etc um flavors and all that stuff you see it you taste it and you come to try and know it to a certain extent um so yeah and humans tend to think that they own language but we only own the words that we created um which is really huge for doing speculate, speculative philosophy, asking questions, trying to get like the right question off. You have to, you have to subvert your own assumptions, um, your own, and that's that means like asking like, what does this word really mean to me? How do I define it? What connections are connected to this word in my head? And um, trying to get a grasp on like your your strength of language and also your ultimate like disconnect from it is important for doing philosophy. Um, so in the end, language is a medium one exists within and participates in, but we're hardly in control of it. Um, that was that topic. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions about that. Um, I do have three more topics. Um, some of them will be a bit shorter because I didn't take as many notes because I ran out of time. Um, but <clears throat> let me see. Okay, I was right about Ozymandias. <clears throat> um, it's a great comment on the nature of empire. Also, the perfect thing to listen to for ASMR. I think I missed what was perfect for ASMR. It's about great works and watching them fall, I think. Ozymandias. Most important thing. Two most important things for a poem. Okay. Muses are deceitful. Yes. Um, okay. <clears throat> I need so much water. I'm sorry. Okay, my third, um, my third theme is relationships, a world of subjects. So this is really key also to ancient Greek thinking. It's a different way of being in the world, of constructing your being uh, and your relationships. It's different from thinking from how we usually think in postmodern and modern society about a scientific world of objects. Um, so the theogony is just suffused with life and spirit and is quite different from our own. Um, all the parts of nature have proper names. They are alive. They're, they are either, <clears throat> I mean, they're personified, which has anthropological problems, um, anthropomorphic issues, but also they are respected, uh, deeply worshipped, and um, thought of as a profoundly deep connection between people and nature and everything is just alive it breathes and demands respect and wonder 
um, compared to us walking outside every day, like, look at that stupid fucking tree or look at this stupid rock and you just kick it across the street. <laughs> like, I'm just going to go chop down a whole forest today. Like, um, that would, that would never have happened, at least not without like moderation and respect and, um, uh, <clears throat> offerings and sacrifice and all that kind of thing in ancient Greek society. Um, so even though the thinking of the world in such a way seem, may seem childish to us postmodern beings in a scientific world, there's something to learn from such a way of thinking, I think, that ranges from environmental justice to reinvigorating your own spiritual life. Um, the former is obvious. You can hear scientists today still talk about, mention the Gaia hypothesis that informed the environmental movement of the 90s. I'm not going to harp on environmental justice too much because there's like so much awareness about it right now. And um, I think it's kind of obvious. Um, in terms of our postmodern spiritual life, I think I got some shit to say about that. Like in this capitalist, technocratic, self-reliant, materialist society we live in, we're just like spiritually fucked. Uh, finding deep connections is super difficult because of cultural attitudes of individualism and uh, fears of our neighbor. Uh, additionally, the way in which we think of ourselves as individuals since Rene Descartes' modern philosophy has skewed our sense of communal self has totally changed the way like ancient societies uh thought about the self and um community politics what it means to be a neighbor or a friend or a son or something like that um this is a topic for a later date when i talk about descartes and i'm not saying like we should go back to slaughtering a black lamb to gaia and a white one to helios because that's what they had to do uh, I'm not even saying ancient Greek society was a golden age and we should live just like them because they had slaves, they beat women, they groomed young men into sex cults, they had insane wealth disparities, and so many other terrible things, so many other traditions that just were just everywhere. They had a class, class society, um, super rich people, all of the philosophers were elitists and like you couldn't be a philosopher and be poor you were you were amazingly wealthy if you were a philosopher a poet an artist um anything like that um i only want to ask like and you guys can talk about this if you want or this can be rhetorical for you to think about like what if we thought of the connections to being around beings around us more seriously like nature um our family, our friends, like our relationship to our, our politics and like, uh, that kind of stuff. How would our lives change? To what extent does thinking of ourselves as individuals first sabotage our relationships and our democracy? Um, I think those are really important questions for right now. Of course, uh, the way that we're living, the troubles, the, bullshit we're facing every day um i don't know if like i mean you can try and write stuff all you want only certain people will be will read anything that you write but you know trying to trying to think about this stuff you never know what it can change for you change for another person in your life or just a random person that you meet um Life with more intention and meaning. Yeah, true. Um, at the same time, you can put all the intention and meaning you want into your life, and it can still just go horribly wrong, and <laughs> you can fuck everything up, and um, life has its own plans sometimes. So I'm not saying, like, if you think about these questions, you're going to change your whole life. This isn't some fucking self-help class or something. Um, you can only do what you can do given the circumstances and uh, of your life and everything. Um, what is... Uh, oh, sorry, I'm going to try and say your name. Karami... Caramelo? <laughs> I don't want to say it wrong. Um, I think you followed me. 
I thank you for that. Um, I believe that individuals should, <laughs> that's Kyle's, it's true, it's true. I believe that individuals should have choices over their own lives, but I do believe there's something to be said for collectivism and more connection with people. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I'm not like arguing for like ancient Greek society at all. I was just reading briefly an article about how they patrolled marriages that had like laws upon laws upon laws on marriages. Single women, if you were single and old, they would persecute you. And um, they had all these like overwhelming kind of views and laws about a community that were egregious and took away from citizens liberty um and stuff that was real like not like not like it's not in a poem it's not like it's not um in a philosophical text it was it's it was their laws um so yeah collectivism can be dangerous um but yeah sort of yeah uh, getting a right balance, like you said, um, Kara, I guess is what I'll call you if that's okay. Um, it seems like we're done with that. Um, number four, I got two more topics. Uh, I don't know if Paul's still here. I haven't seen him in a minute. He must be busy. Um, Topic number four, I'm going to improvise a bit. It's it's called Monsters. Um, plurality of cows allows for diversity. And also, it's this topic is about ontological liminality, um, which is a ridiculous phrase that means um, beings or characters that cross borders of normalcy. Um, those can be anything from transgender to uh people who um don't totally participate in uh like normalized gender categories or people who have different um lifestyles that the society doesn't approve of and generally outcasts but also beings that are hybrid like also, I'm not trying to compare transgender to uh, any, like, monsters, but this is this is literally the definition. Like, uh, is also ontological limina liminality, beings of hybrid, also covers werewolves and vampires, monsters of mythicality, uh, cyborgs, stuff like that. Um, it's just, it can be any character that crosses and lives in two worlds, like... Um, it can be, it could be like, it can be like, um, like a Jewish person in the Holocaust disguised as a Nazi who has to live in these two worlds and, uh, maybe somehow has some, or some cultural conflict where, uh, a person is, uh, like has African American, but has a white parent and an African father or, um, something like that. Danny Phantom. Yeah. Like people who are stuck in two worlds, that kind of thing. Um, so you could see monsters in the text from the echidna to chimera to typhoon, um, who is this like cacophony and like Zeus comes in as this big judge and has to order the, the problem, which is like a total metaphor for philosophy. Like, goes in and sees this monster with a snake head a dragon head a goat head a fucking mouse head breathing fire and speaking 10 languages like this thing can't exist because it's like unknown and that's part of that's part of monsters in any any film any book any myth they're like live in these is it similar to double consciousness or does it have to be physical um I'm not sure. I mean, I think double consciousness is possible. If you're like, maybe if you're thinking, um, are you thinking like multiple personalities like Norman Bates or something? Or is double consciousness like uh, a uh, psycho um, 
fuck, what's it called? A psychological term. I mean, I was, oh, double consciousness, like, um, like race, like you're all, you're an American, but you're also like an African American. So you have two, two kind of lives, um, that you have to deal with two existences. I was mentioning that some with, um, trying to say like two cultures clash, two cultures clashing your, your two identities. Yeah. I don't know if I didn't make that clear enough or something but that's what i was trying to say yeah double consciousness can definitely count as some sort of monster like state um ontological liminality um so uh monsters yes um monsters have to be they generally try to get ordered which is usually killing them because they can't exist in an ordered reality and there's also this um, this eroticism about them. People are attracted to them almost always in, I mean, not, not necessarily real life, but in the text. Um, and they like, it, they want to, it, they believe it says something about themselves or about their culture. So uh, it's like this sort of reverse psychology thing. Like you're supposed to be terrified of it, but you're, super like attracted to it um other monsters in the text are monstrous birth um interesting tie to posthumanism yeah thank you <laughs> um monstrous birth is something that happens in the text like i know that that's always a possibility it depends on i'm not gonna say monstrous births happen in real life um in the text they happen and like, like the th the hundred handers that um, that Uranus wants to hide, there's to me it's it's an analogy, it's a metaphor for like birth defects or um, like you want to hide away like the albino child or um, like something like they would have been totally ignorant about like like if you had a child with down syndrome in ancient greek society like it i don't know everything about this but um it it's like something that would have been ostracized and would have been considered a monster um that kind of thing um i do think that there's room for allegory in that and discussion about which is also something that was seen as like original monsters people with birth defects with mental disabilities um that is something that is was very real in history and could be a very real like lens to analyze um like the hiding of these like monsters and beasts um um i am curious about shame the function of shame in the theogony because oranos was the first person to do bad things or shameful things and then um Prometheus is shamed and Zeus isn't really shamed, but he's sent into hiding and stuff. Uh, so bad things like monstrous kind of behavior, like behavior that crosses the line or tries to like make your own law. Like Prometheus tries to uh, trick Zeus and stuff like that. And, um, uh, I did miss a thing I wanted to talk about, but, um, one thing that could be shameful is rape in the text. I'm not sure if it's actually there or if I read into it too much. Um, I, I would have to read a different version. I had another version, but I lost it, um, over the years. Another thing that I skipped was, and another thing that a lot of societies, ancient societies have myths about are incest, um, because it's a taboo topic. Um, I didn't know if possibly the ancestral incestual relationships in the text result in some sort of birth defect or, um, like this metaphorical monster, um, 
in the text. I think that that's a possible reading, um, but I'm not so sure about that. Um, another thing, one last thing in this topic, this topic is some things mashed together, is self. Um, uh, monsters always have like multiple selves. Sunset mentioned double consciousness, which the example most commonly talked about where I went to school at times was um, being American and an African American um, trying to navigate the pitfalls and dangers and um, differences that crop up between like white American culture um, and how to behave in in one culture and doing code switching between African American culture and um, white culture and um, behavioral switching yeah Du Bois that's right um yeah so we have a lot of ideas that we are just a single self in this kind of world that we live in this modern world um but that's monsters show that with like Jekyll and Hyde vampire werewolf kind of stuff um even even transgender people I'm not going to call them monsters but um they're in the the category of being beings that are in hybrid worlds um they can show that we have multiple sides to ourselves. the self is really complicated it's definitely not one cre concrete thing um yourself is determined by your environment i live in the mountains now sometimes that makes me feel like a different person um i don't think it changes my behavior wildly but um uh it can change the way you think the way you walk around um and stuff like that um your relationships if you have a if you're adopted or you um have a parent who is deceased or a step step children step step siblings or like abusive parents or stuff like that that can really change yourself like it's yourself is formed by your relationships it's not just some essence that you have and that also leads back to chaos it all leads back to chaos because nothing is one everything is multiple and in a web of intricate relationships that you you cannot untangle you can trace some of them um you can you can learn some of them but you're never in your lifetime like maybe someone can continue on your work after you're dead but never in your lifetime are you going to figure out like your whole self you will be evolving <clears throat> and adapting and changing until you die um that's pretty much what i have to say about that um i was wondering about oranos as a monster type thing because he goes on to exist without male genitals um i don't know what that makes him after that he seems like chill like not like a jerk after that um like i guess it was just desire and his giant sky penis like making him do bad things um uh i don't know um yeah, I was wondering about Uranus. That's I don't have that much to say about that. Um, yeah, let me see. Um, nature versus nurture. Um, I think nature versus nurture is, in some ways, a false, overblown, um, kind of like social scientific argument that is like really kind of interesting but kind of kind of done to death and there's not i don't know i don't think there's that much more to say about it uh andre the giant fan my friend brady here um says i think it's both and i think according with the way i've been talking about kaos in this sort of idiom um yes you are born with certain personality traits you can be like Yo-Yo Ma and be born a, a prodigy with like 
you have some sort of fucking brain patterns or chemicals in your neurological pathways um, that, you know, make you more adept at understanding and reading music and moving your fingers in that sort of way. Um, also, it's does of course it's nurture as well because they start him at two years old or whatever um he doesn't just randomly pick it up when he's 35 and he's like oh shit i'm a fucking boss at the bass or whatever he plays or cello um it's a cello i think um yeah it's it's both i mean (laughs) nature and nurture it's it's cows um i think my real problem with the existence of some idea within nature versus nurture is its implicature of lack of choice um yeah that's that's something that actually comes up in plato's republic um i don't know if you've read this paul but like the one life one work kind of idea that everybody was born to do one thing and you can only do that one thing except for philosophers who can also be kings um but uh i think i think plato i'm not going to get too deep into this but plato is more speculating than saying that's real um in in like real life like you're born to do one thing and that's all you can ever do um uh lack of choice um we read plato's republic for philosophy of education yeah um some idea within nature versus nurture could you clarify that um are you my real problem with the existence of some idea within nature versus nurture is its implicature of lack of choice that's what you hate about like the what always comes up when people bring up nature versus nurture you think like there's always a choice is that what i'm uh uh hearing you say or am i reading that wrong i'll just stop for a minute for you to respond Uh, anyone else could talk about nature versus nurture too if they desire like we're discussing this right now (laughs) let's discuss it yeah, so like to say everything boils down to nature or nurture would mean that choice doesn't exist. Yeah, I mean that's kind of like the either or falsity. Um it's just having these two uh polarities, these two options, it's it's absurd. I mean, life is extremely complicated. We don't understand it that much even with all the science that we have. Um it's it's bullshit. I think it's arrogant and foolish to say that we know it's nature or we know it's nurture. I mean, there could be any other element involved in it as well. Um, like something more mythical like fate or um, probability. It's like to say that someone's a psychopathic murderer because of their upbringing would therefore negate the fact that they made a conscious choice to murder someone. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's like, I don't, I haven't studied serial killers or anything like that, but I think it's obvious to me, for some reason, that anyone who's a psychopathic murderer also was born with mental illness or something uh, to that effect. Um, It's not just going to be like, mommy didn't breastfeed you or like you didn't make friends at the sandbox so you became a murderer like there's something else like it's it's always going to be a mixture um i think we're saying the same thing uh i want to be clear like we don't have to agree but um i'm just thinking that we're saying the same thing truth and in some cases would negate the fact that their brain fails to work in a proper fashion yeah um that's true too um like it's entirely possible that somebody somebody has a nice upbringing but they're mentally ill and they don't get therapy or they don't get the right um psychiatric treatments 
and so they like experience delusions and nature can affect nurture which can affect choice yeah and also vice versa i think um nurture can affect nature which also can affect choice like it's a totally complicated web of history and um biology uh behavioral patterns learned throughout your uh growing up um yeah what i was trying i didn't don't think i finished my thought like it's totally possible for someone to have a great upbringing but then not get the medication that they need or the therapy and then just lose it and like shoot up a high school um it could it could like have nothing to do with the way that they were brought up like the parents tried their best and did everything they knew how to do but like the the healthcare system failed them like it does fail millions of americans every day um and yeah i think yeah i think that that's i mean the the i was gonna say that the discussion with that's put to bed but like it's never done like um but for the moment i think that we've all shared our opinions and um yes relationships are key um but um okay i think we're ready to move on to the last topic um last topic is rule of the father authority law and containment so i made this topic there's also going to be another subtopic about women if if we could talk about that a bit um i'm not that familiar with how to do feminist analysis um but um i do think that there's something to be said about how way the the raw deal women are given in the the, the theogony um but let me talk about this because i did take philosophy of law and i did write my thesis on a philosophy of law subject so let me discuss this for a minute um so the pattern of succession in the tale is Uranus, Kronos, Zeus. It's definitely a political allegory of the failure of autocracies, which is usually the earliest attempt at law, just seize power by force, force everybody to do what you want them to do. Like you don't write anything down. It's just like today I want this today. I feel like this, or this is my long held conviction. You better listen to me or I'll exile you or I'll kill you or torture you or something. Um, that's, that's autocracy in a nutshell, in a nutshell. Um, and then you, in autocracies, you usually like lend political, you lend your like, um, relationships, like your son, your lineage, like the power to offspring. And so you try and contain your opponents, anybody who opposes you, your power, you get rid of them, you kill them um stuff like that that's exactly what happens in the text um lock them up try and contain your power at all costs because it's you versus everybody you ha you don't have the people on your side i mean you might always dictators and aut autocratic rulers have their cronies they have their like secret police and stuff but you don't have the majority of people on your side um because it's not uh it's not a democracy or a republic um so the law is always used to force the one into the many um so i should have talked about this a little bit more earlier um so this is something that is a problem for philosophy i talked about philosophy of language um it's a problem that it's a political problem that every society faces, and it's especially one that Plato tried to work on, um, and probably Aristotle too, which was like, how do you take the voices of the many and put them into one, one constitution, into one law, into one society? Um, so into like one judgment or something like that. Um, you trying to contain so many things into one and that is that is what chaos kind of does it's like this one thing we have this placeholder we call it chaos but at the same time chaos is nuts and it's 
you we know that you cannot contain a def excuse me a definition of like a thing with one word with one universal word different opinions different languages uh different ideas about what the word should mean the same thing goes for politics um you try and make an amendment and then it turns out like it was terrible because you didn't get enough multiple people's opinions in this one idea um like when they tried to end slavery but then they had all these terrible rules still because they didn't ask any african americans um and so uh stuff like that like it's really difficult it's a really big political problem um trying to con that's what the law does it tries to contain many behaviors into one thing like all possible um i mean there's room for interpretation but all possible like possibilities <laughs> and like contingencies are supposed to be in one one law like never run a never run a stop sign um what if you're being chased by a serial killer what if you have to get your pregnant wife to the hospital what if all these things come up and um you cannot contain every behavior in one thing and that's what the law tries to do, tries to do um and that is this is the word the ancient greek word for law is nomos which is literally like a container it was like it was like an area for like sheep and stuff it also means law and custom um so the rule of the father is essentially is autocratic rule um it was in ancient greek society it was in ancient roman society um you could you had total power over everyone in the family roman fathers could just kill their sons if they disobeyed them at some point and at another point they they um they changed that law they amended it it became less powerful but um the father rules over everything over who the daughter gets to go to over the domestic sphere when he comes home and can do literally anything he wants because he owns his wife because that's what domestication is domesticating the woman into uh this this worker who's your servant and um the father tells the children what they do with their lives um has total control over like if he can send them to war or um make them into slaves and all this stuff um so that's the rule of the father it's an extreme patriarchal view in ancient greek society and it totally gets played out throughout the whole story it's really key to the structure of the story and um like the structure of history of course of men trying to maintain their power desperately and then losing their power because they have a son or um they have a rival and they can't contain them with with um force because they're not strong enough um that's <laughs> that's like you could sum up a lot of history with that um and it's still prevalent to this day with the majority of men being our political leaders and majority of men being like oh, i pay the bills around here majority of men in the workforce um and majority of men getting upper level jobs and more possibilities higher pay um and making all the laws uh i mean women didn't get to vote until like what 1919 i think um and because it was an extreme patriarchal society before that um and um, it still in many ways continues to be follow the rule of the father. I mean, obviously since like the sixties and stuff, women can get divorced super easily, um, have more control over their lives and freedoms. Um, but I mean, before, before women had the right to vote, it was like, you could beat the shit out of your wife. Nobody gave a shit. That was your that was your rule. That was your law. You own the house. It's castle law. You, your own house is your own little piece of land. You make up the laws in your house, essentially. Um, 
Husbandry, exactly. Husbandry is domestication of the woman. Um, being a husband is... Um, husbandry is domestication of animals, and being a husband to a wife was originally to um, tame the wife and to beat her into submission and um, have sex with her whenever you wanted, um, even if it was unconsensual. And that that's... That's the tough view of history, of the rule of the father. Um, it's a very real theme throughout history and still in our lives today. Um, it's luckily not so bad, um, but still work to do on that front, of course. Always work to do. Um, I'm not going to get too much into philosophy of law because it's kind of boring and <laughs> long and... Um, yeah, crud, that's dark. Marriage is whack. Marriage is whack. Um, indeed. Um, and the ancient Greeks were obsessed with marriage. Um, I already mentioned that. Um, something else is that Paul brought it up earlier, like about Zeus being a good judge and a, this paradigm of goodness even though he like cheats on his wife and um, like a million times and chases down these women to rape them and um, and all this like stuff, uh, but they mention um, I think I'm gonna read this part again real quick as I'm winding down um, about Zeus being a good leader. It's on 85 to 86. Um, do, do, do. All the people look towards him while he settles causes with true judgments, and he speaks, and he speaking surely would soon make wise and even of a great quarrel. For therefore are their princes wise in heart, because when the people are being misguided in their assembly, this is referring to when they are like assembled for a democratic discussion. Um, they set right the matter again with ease, persuading them with gentle words. So the, the good Zeus uh, is a good leader because he shows up at the democratic assemblage and persuades people, uses words, doesn't fight people, even though he does some terrible shit to Prometheus and women. Um, and when he passes through a gathering, they greet him as a god with gentle reverence, and he is conspicuous amongst the assembled, such as the holy gift of the muses to men. Uh, so the muses give men great leaders, such as, like, in the form and behavior of Zeus. Um, he's always around. He's always, like, calming people down, persuading people. Um, is... Uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of interesting because that shows what they want leaders to be like in ancient Greece. Um, they want them to be calm and collected. They don't want them to be these autocratic Kronos and Uranos leaders. Um, they want them to assemble the people, discuss things, um, be fair, and um, be around, you know, um, which sounds great but um uh it's interesting that zeus is this complicated character with this anger if you could if you piss him off he'll tie you to a mountaintop and make your liver regrow every day so an eagle can eat it and he'll put a spear through your chest <laughs> and like spike you to the mountaintop it's just like Zeus can be really fucked up and he also does the same thing that his his grandfather and father did swallowed his children or hid them away and it worked out for him just by sheer luck honestly Athena popped out of his fucking head and <laughs> I don't know why they just needed an ending sometimes it feels like so something had to be different um I don't know. Um, Zeus can be interesting. Maybe he needs more of analysis. Um, castration is like the ultimate ending to the 
rule of the father. Uh, symbolically, it could be a symbolic castration like loss of power because of the phallic symbol of power, the penis and the genitals and everything. Um, <clears throat> but he, Ornos is literally castrated and loses his power. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's a story choice that they made. Um, Zeus promises, uh, Zeus ends the pattern. I didn't mention this. Zeus ends the pattern. Actually, I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, Zeus ends the fucking pattern by giving out like parcels of land and power to all of the gods and nicely freeing the hundred handers because they didn't do anything wrong, even though he just uses them to, um, to guard the Titans and lock them up. He doesn't really care about them that much. Um, he turns it into some kind of, usually there are a lot of aristocracies in ancient Greece and oligarchies. Eventually it's a democratic Republic, depending on which town you're in, like Athens or Sparta or Thebes. Um, they, they, it was like one country and culture thing, but they had different names for gods worship different gods specifically and um, didn't have a national identity like nationalism didn't exist back then. <clears throat> so they were really different places, um, the different cities, and they fought each other a lot, um, killed each other um, over land. Um, uh, I'm going to look at the questions in a minute. I think I'm almost done with my notes. Um okay um yeah sunset asked earlier about why do they contain their children um why is the why is he so afraid i mean it's like the prophecies from the gods are very real to them and like if you if it was a real ruler in like ancient greece and they got a prophecy from a seer which they actually had seers like who read birds and shit, like signs from birds and flocks and said like, Hey, your grandson's going to overthrow you. They would have threw that fucking baby off a cliff or like imprisoned him or something. And, um, yeah, like it has, I think it does have a real like life connection. Um, containment of the new is, is something that happens in Shakespeare too, is like containing, the it's containing the unknown i mean anytime there's another person in the lineage it's it's the uh it's the possibility that they will betray you that you will lose your power um and yeah it's it's a real fear for autocracy and that something that ends that fear is democracy in democratic republics because it's not it's not rule by lineage um so i think that somehow <laughs> zeus luckily gets athena born out of his head and stops the prophecy um but that's something that is literally about autocratic rule um is my opinion on that um you could have another interpretation of course but um it's it's how they react to monsters unknown elements like new children who could overthrow them, betray them, stuff like that. You have to contain them. You have to know them, put a name on it. Um, even though language isn't able to like contain them. Um, so like the plurality of chaos even affects your own children and especially in political autocracies. Um, um, so they usually resort to force and not law and, um, deliberation um, and the force, the container can never free them. That's another, um, they always escape either, whether it's the stomach, the womb, the Titans will eventually escape their prison. Um, the law never contains forever. Um, so yeah, um, that's honestly like all I have to say. I'm going to look that's dark marriage is whack boycott marriage 
Kara said, the nature of autocracy inherently creates a climate in which anything you do eventually would be undermined in some way in an autocratic society, such as the world of gods. This undermining ends up in the death of the leading autocrat. Exactly, Kara. That's what I was just uh, trying to discuss with Sunset. Um, it ends up creating too much competition. That is good for maintaining power whilst you are powerful. When you become weak, however, it's another story. Sorry, this was so long. No, that wasn't too long. Um, I'm the one who goes on for too long. Um, Under the Giant fan said metal. I'm guessing about Prometheus's punishment. Sunset said, sorry if you already said this, but why is heaven the first being to do something shameful? Why does heaven get castrated? What does that say about heaven? Um, I did talk about it, actually. Um, I was wondering what the shameful thing was. I was spitballing about it um, because there's a possibility of incest because Oranos has sex with Gaia, who is Gaia's mother. Um, there's a possibility of rape um, and there's the possibility of just chaining up your children. I mean, not letting them be born. Um, he gets castrated because it's a it's a power move it's it's symbolic but it's also realistic like the autocratic male rulers power is real and then like the symbol of power for the law of the father is the phallic penis and genitals um so i think it's kind of cool interesting that it's both symbolic and literal um like he literally can't have children anymore so he'll have nothing to stuff away really um and then he won't be up on gaia so that they can get out of her womb he'll be out of the way and then um he gets castrated for yeah one of the three things incest rape or not letting his children be born slash imprisoning them um they never really say exactly what the shameful thing is i mean gaia's in great pain it says in the text because he's shoving all these children back into her womb. Um, you can imagine how disgusting and painful that would be. Um, yeah. Uh, so he was the first person to do anything bad in the world. Um, what does that say about heaven? Um, yeah. Like why do they make sky the villain? <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I didn't really think about that. Um, Gaia is like the giver and like the earth mother type thing, fertility, stuff like that. Um, that's like the goddess. She was kind of worshipped, not really by herself, but with Hecate, um, which I didn't touch on very much um, and other goddesses. But um, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly about their heaven um why heaven is the villain necessarily um i think i think i imagine if you were like a ancient society the sky could be kind of scary i don't know it's like lightning and like tornadoes and hurricanes and stuff it seemed like that stuff would come from the sky um I'm not sure. That's an interesting thing to think about. Um, why, why sky? Why, why the heavens? As um, what does it say about heaven that it's the villain to uh, in the story? Um, yeah, interesting. But like, also, Narcissus is a demigod who is the epitome of a non-virtuous concept why did why did you bring up narcissus i don't remember bringing him up was there um did i bring him up and forget or <laughs> um i am done with my notes um you guys can discuss with each other or ask any questions I could try to answer. I need to go to the bathroom and get water. Um.
Are you sure you can't just hear it in the mic? No, cuz I like, I went like this, and I could hear the speaker, so I didn't know they were there. Oh. Mhm. Just they haven't said anything yet, but I'm like, "Excuse me." [laughs] [laughs] For the recording. Hey, you guys, you guys are the real ones. [laughs] [laughs] Maybe I should take this. Mic stand. But I'm like, "That's so bad. Cuz we can't have like kitchen appliances here, so I need to get some like" [noise] Paul's got something to say. You're talking about things that Zeus did that wasn't reflective of what a god should be. But in just in case you justification of the patriarchy and what the Greeks want. So you're saying like the gods don't have to be perfect. Um As long as they have something great about them. Oh, I I was gonna talk about women. Can't forget that part. Of course. What do you do more philosophy streams? [noise] I should, uh, this is my first one. I didn't know how many people would get into it. Most of these [laughs] Kara, unless you're somebody that I know secretly, you're the only random person who showed up and stayed. [laughs] Um, I did have a couple people show up, but they were like, "What the fuck is this shit?" Somebody didn't seem to like my rules and then left. Um I will, I think I'm gonna, I'm saying that gods should be perfect and it's weird that the Greek and Romans didn't believe that. Um I will do another philosophy stream on on Sunday, I think. I got here late, but I'm subbed now. It's okay. Um Oh, Irk the Jerk. I thought you were the other person. You have the same color. Um What's up, Irk the Jerk? Yeah, I I am pretty much winding down. Um Paul is saying gods should be perfect and it's weird that Greek and Romans didn't believe that. Um Kara, I am gonna do another stream, I can't remember if I answered that on Sunday, uh, about the pre-Socratics. I don't know how many I'm gonna do. They all have a lot of really short fragments, um, but there's a lot to talk about with them. Um I'll try and cover as much ground as I can with them for another This is [noise] this has been almost three hours. Um Ah, okay. Yes, Paul. Um They talk about this in the Euthyphro. I don't know if you've read this, Paul, like how they're not perfect. Um They mention something about Socrates and Euthyphro have a little bit of an argument about that, I think, about whether or not the gods are actually like the way that they are represented or if they're totally different and like perfect and um, we just have the information that we have, but it's just a appearance and like a Socrates is always trying to make like the appearance argument, um, at some point, um, we made the gods and these tales and our imperfect image. It's true. I think that it's interesting that the gods are fallible. Um, and a lot of the tales are parables and analogies, allegories for, um, the history of ancient Greece, in my opinion, not that I know that much of the history, but to me, it feels obvious, uh, just as like a, a sort of, um, inference. Um, yeah, they do have a, an, an argument about it. Socrates and Euthyphro, um, what a glorious mane and mustache combo. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, I'm trying to finish this thought. Um,
It's a question on what we believe the gods are. Are they made as easy explanations? Are they actually doing all these things? It's really unclear, even to the ancient Greek philosophers, like, and even to us as outsiders on ancient Greek culture, is like how much, how much they, um, how much, how much the ancient Greeks, like, as an as audience members, thought this was, some of it was like fan fiction stuff. Or some of it, like, how much did they actually believe was canon? Um, uh, of, like, what the poems and the epics had to say about the gods. Um, how much of it was entertainment to them? Um, and there are different versions of the tales, like I was saying earlier. And they get changed, they get passed down, they get revised. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of speculation to be had in this department about like did they think the gods were perfect or imperfect or did they think these stories were just for fun sometimes or did they believe in more seriously some of them more seriously than others or some versions were more serious and some were more joking like that kind of stuff it's like it's like crazy historical stuff you can never know um uh if you like try and think out think it out too much um in in my opinion, I think I don't know. I think I want to make the epistemological argument like we literally don't know like how how the ancient Greek people like took these stories as like how seriously they took them as tr as um as truth. Ancient Greeks did write fan fiction. Um ancient romans wrote fan fiction in the form of poems and like love poems like ovid and uh tibullus and propertius and catullus they all like make up their own little love stories and uh, may use them to like uh attract lovers and stuff yes there's a lot i did learn that in my roman erotic poetry class like if i learned anything it's like there are versions of the tales that people knew were not true and people could play with the mythos. They could play with the canon and it's like somehow they didn't like be called like, uh, sacrilegious or like traitors. They were like allowed to make them into little characters with different, different arcs and different, um, slightly different characteristics. Um, it's it's interesting because there's not it's not like i mean the gods were revered but also at the same time the texts for them are historical and they're also entertainment they're also like art there's you could take artistic freedom with it because it's not like there's a sacred text about the gods and you have to respect that text and if you disrespect it like you're going to hell or we're going to fucking kill you or exile you or something. Um, they have a different relationship with the ideas of deities and theology than we think about today. Um, I don't know how to like what term to use to describe it. Um, I don't know. It's more like lax, but then also the rituals were really serious and you don't disrespect the gods at the temples and stuff. Um, I don't know. It's it's hard to say when we're missing so much documentation. Um, the language is dead. Um, a lot of texts are fragmented, found like burnt up and like half decayed and um, that kind of stuff. Um, but it is interesting that they think of the gods as imperfect and um it's a very different idea of um spiritual i don't want to call it religion it's not a religion um it's a very different idea to, of theism um a different approach i'll say um i'm gonna look at sunset's comment here sorry I went on about that. Um, in terms of why heaven is the villain, which is really bugging me and I want to know why, I'm thinking that he was most likely shamed for hiding his children away and uh, not 
for raping the earth because they probably didn't have laws about or morality con ethical concerns about rape back then uh as definitely it actually probably depends on your class um you couldn't just go and have sex with like an elite person um i don't think but uh i think that they had some levels of i believe for some reason that they had that they would have some levels of protection for rape um in that society even though they also kidnapped women and married them and raped them and forced them to be their wives um terrible shit like that um so you think it's more likely that he was shamed for hiding his children away because of the differences in our society so why should heaven be sa shamed for hiding his children away is it because we did create these ideas and without the children of the earth heaven wouldn't exist i'm just spitballing here um hmm because we created these ideas and without the children the heaven would earth wouldn't exist well i don't know maybe maybe there's an argument to be made like he did hurt his <laughs> gaia is is the sky's mother and sex partner and the mother to his children um they're not married there's no marriage in the thing really um so maybe he maybe it's something fucked up like he disrespected his mother by hurting her because he stuffs the children back in the womb and i don't i think it's even though it's a patriarchal society with the rules of the father you still don't disrespect your parents um uh maybe there's something like that i didn't think about that before um why should he be shamed for hiding his children away possibly yeah not it's not balanced for the world like it's necessary for these children who are gods and like elements to go out into the world so he's disrupting the whole natural order of things which is necessary um could be something like that those are my new ideas i'm speculating too like um disrespecting hurting his mother and destroying the natural order of things as they're supposed to be i mean it's even natural for children to be born if you put them back in the womb it's like that's just fucked up i mean <laughs> they must have thought that was wrong too um I was looking at your channel, I saw you did philosophy and Pokemon, and I was like, hell yeah. Also, no, I don't know you in real life. Okay. Ancient Greeks wrote fan fiction. I already answered that. You have a favorite Greek god or mythos? That is so cool. Uh, I just learned my favorite today. Guy who ate a baby and vomited out <laughs> an entirely different baby. Oh, Zeus? Yeah. I have a favorite Greek god or mythos. Um, <laughs> I'm stumped on this one because I'm not like... I'm not like a huge fan of like the Greek gods or anything. I just find this philosophically interesting. Um and like as a scholarly subject and like for discussion um favorite greek god or mythos i think the minotaur is pretty cool <laughs> and weird because like i don't remember who's it, who all the characters are but like somebody somebody has to create the minotaur like they create like a fake bull costume to f trick someone into having sex with them and then they some i don't know like a bull or something or a monster fucks the bull or something and then but there's like a god or a human in the bull costume and then the minotaur is made because of the bull and the human is like half bull and half human <laughs> i think the minotaur maze is pretty cool like the labyrinth and stuff um 
I don't know, there's some kind of like bestiality taboo in the Minotaur mythos. And I think that uh, it's got like Pegasus and um, uh, he has to go like get to the center to get the sword and like to save his lover. I think it's like a classic kind of interesting <laughs> tale with some weird shit in it. Um, yeah. Oedipus is really interesting. I read that a couple months ago in quarantine. And I also read like Electra and that was good. And Antigone, those are all like Greek tragedies. Antigone's really good. Um, I still haven't talked about women. Um, I was trying to get there. <laughs> um, Gaia is very respected. It's cool. It makes sense. Gaia is... I was researched at some, there was like this, the big mother or something like that. Um, big earth mother is like a prehistoric sort of figure that they think Gaia was based off of. There's like, there's um old sort of statues and stuff of her where she's like really giant and has like giant breasts to like uh, display fertility and um, that kind of thing. And Gaia is sort of similar to that um it's i mean it's sort of necessary i don't think it like really i don't think it like it didn't like empower women in ancient greek society that gaia was a woman like the earth was a woman um and there's also like there's um gender politics involved in that with like defiling the earth and um, defiling women and that kind of thing, which gets kind of messy. Um, <clears throat> like, did they, did they see the earth as a woman first or then like, and then, or did they see the earth as an earth and then make a metaphor out of it being a woman because it gives and, um, <clears throat> produces things and reproduces things. Um, or did they like, was it just necessary as a metaphor or something? I'm not sure. Um, you could go, you could probably argue, argue either way. Like Gaia, the earth being a woman is like powerful to women or the earth being a woman is like negative because she has to do everything. She doesn't get no respect and, um, she gets defiled and all this stuff. Um, I'm not sure. Um, what else was there about women? There's really three things. Uh, Pandora. Zeus makes women evil. I don't know why this is, <laughs> why this is a uh, connected. You have to use like mythological thinking or just like Sunset said, maybe Hesiod got, had a bad breakup or someone broke his heart or something like for Prometheus stealing fire and giving it to men. Um, Zeus creates Pandora, who's the first woman and makes women evil and deceitful. And then, uh, Pandora in the popularized version of the myth, like lets all the monsters out with her curiosity and everything. But then I was reading that there are earlier versions like Pandora mean can mean like all giving or all good, or it can mean different things depending on the translation. And in other versions, she opens this jar and it gives all the good things to the world. Um, so, there are different versions, I guess, depending on, I don't know, the storyteller originally, like if they hated women or thought women were great or just had a bad breakup. I don't know. The the one where she unleashes hell in the apocalypse pretty much is the most popular one. Um, yeah. Women being evil... And deceitful is like a stupid old trope um, in lots of ancient societies, um, in ancient, like, erotic, Roman erotic poetry. Uh, they, like, blame women a lot for their problems, and you still hear that today, like, gender war kind of stuff. Um, women are the root of all evil, or men are just lazy pigs and that kind of stuff, and... Um, 
yeah, it's definitely a thing. Um, it's not fair. It's it's a bad rap for them. Um, it's stupid. It's misogynistic and prejudiced. Um, obviously, women aren't all evil. Men aren't all evil. Um, it's just a stupid universalist thing that doesn't make any sense. Thanks, Kara. Um, I hope to see you on one of my other streams or next Sunday. Um, I'm glad you found it interesting. It was the first time I did it. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope you got some something out of it. Um, the last thing uh, Sunset commented on it when I read it was Athena being born from Zeus's head. Um, Athena is pretty much the most powerful of all the Greek gods who is a woman. Um, and it's the reason for coming out of his head is plot device. And also because it's symbolic of her being the goddess of wisdom, um, because wisdom comes from your brain and, um, is like involved with mental processes. And then the plot point, like I said already, somehow <clears throat> having her born from his head, somehow breaks the cycle i don't know if it's also like a dig against women like if men could have a woman if a man could birth a woman it wouldn't be evil because it wouldn't come from a woman or something stupid like that maybe there is something like that like it negates women but also when zeus said when it says zeus creates women as evil and deceitful that means like human women um, like you don't, you don't see like a lot of evil, deceitful, like Titan women or God women in the story. Um, I think it's supposed to be cause Zeus doesn't create like, yeah, Zeus only creates human women. Um, so there is some sort of disparity or difference there. Um, but maybe it's, it's still a dig at women. Um, I'm not sure. Um, it is kind of lame that the strongest woman comes out of Zeus's head and strange, um, not very empowering image for women. She doesn't even come out as a baby. She just comes out fully dressed in armor and like fully grown. It's really strange. Um, I don't know if, if sunset wants to say something else about women, um, I know I'm pretty sure she's the only woman in the chat as far as I could tell. Um, I would like to hear what I know that it's the text is a bit offensive to women. It's not like outright terrible for them. Um, women are always closer to the monster. They can understand them more and feel more sympathy for them. Therefore they are corrupted. There's always an Eve. Yes. Um, I'm never quite sure which came first. Um, ancient Greek theology or like the Hebrew. Because there's a lot. I know that. I think I, if I remember it correctly. Um, uh, the ancient Greeks did f visit like e ancient Egypt's ancient China and possibly the Hebrews. Um, and I know that there are a lot of connections between the mythoses and some of the philosophies of the Hebrew people and ancient Greece. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting for you to connect the Eve, uh, the Eve sort of character archetype with like Pandora. Um, uh, in general, a lot of mythoses share um, a lot of tales and themes. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I do know what you're saying about women being closer to the monster because they can give birth. They're like uh, more hybrid. They're more fluid and their sort of genders and their behavior patterns and texts and literature and 
Um, yeah. Um, and that can like make them seem corrupted and, uh, get them represented as corrupted and stuff. Um, that's right. That's a, that's post-humanism right there. Um, the earth is a woman because it bears and keeps the monsters. That's a good point. Um, yeah, I don't, I think like in regards to the text, um, I think the only monster that, um, Gaia like gives birth to is Typhoon, um, which is like the, has a bunch of heads and speaks a bunch of languages and, um, all that stuff. But it's like the most terrible one, um, pretty much in the whole theogony. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's a good point. Keeping the monsters under control and, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's 12, 12. The other monsters dwell on the earth, right? No. Um, shit. <laughs> that's a good, uh, that's a good like little detail to ask about. Um, um echidna was born in a cave that's one of the monsters um she gets a house to dwell in they point her a house to dwell in she keeps guard in arima beneath the earth that's somewhere like Tartarus or Hades realm. Um, Cerberus is in Hades. That's a monster. Um, let me see. They mentioned the Hydra. Hera nourishes it because she was mad at Heracles for some reason. Um, Chimera, I don't think it says, Hydra of Lerna, I'm not sure where that is, Chimera is somewhere, <laughs> I think a good, I think a good bit of them are, um, are in Tartarus or Hades and not, like, on the earth, um, Sorry if that like disappoints your connection or anything, Sunset, but um, yeah. Um, sounds like you're wrapping up stream soon, but I wanted to ask, did you ever stream Civilization? Um, I have not streamed Civ. Um, I've only streamed Kenshi, Pokemon Blue version. Um, Pokemon Silver, Soul Silver, XCOM, Enemy Within, and I do have um, Civilization 3 through 6. Um, I have like 3, 4, all the expansions of for 4, 5 with all the expansions, 6 with most of them, and I have Beyond Earth as well. Um, I haven't streamed it yet. I don't know if there's an audience for it. I don't know if it's the most interesting thing to stream. Um, but I would try it because I love Civilization. <laughs> um, to see who gets interested. Uh, like I'm trying this to see who gets interested. Like I love putting all my interests on here to see uh, what happens, you know. Um, or we could play a game. Is this Eric by any chance? Is that why it's Irk? <laughs> um, yeah, I would play with you, Eric. Hi. Um, or you could be an audience. I mean, I'd, I'd play with you. I'd have a bunch of people I would play with, actually. Um, I got a lot of people who love Sim, Civ. I watch a Civ game. Yeah, they can be probably fun um to watch sunset would play um hey Kyle, let's get a game going sometime yeah um 
What's up, dude? Sorry I didn't message you. I've been messaging a lot of people to get them involved, um, but I've been so busy, especially preparing for this. I have like eight pages of notes on this uh, philosophy stream. This took me a lot of time um, and getting things together, and um, I just haven't been doing for, I haven't been doing it I haven't been streaming for a month yet, so I've been trying to get in contact with other people. Sunset, I did a great job, thank you. I wanted to know what other people, what people thought. Um, like, I'll take any pointers. Like, I didn't know if I should show my notes or have a PowerPoint or some kind of visual display. Like, it could be cool to show pictures of the gods or uh, a chimera or like monsters or something. I don't know. If I have more time, I'd like to make more discussion questions. I only had like three and it was only for one topic. Um, I'd like to have more discussion questions like prepared. Um, um, but if you guys think I could do a better time explaining some things, or slowing down, maybe giving more examples. I really only had two examples. Oh shit, I disconnected. Okay. I came in late, but I liked the discussion. Maybe include some visual aids, the interaction with the audience, and feeling the questions was great. Okay, that's good. Um, compliment sandwich. Thank you. I just disconnected for a minute. I haven't done that today. Um, um, uh, Brady, Brady and Paul, are you still there? I want your guys' opinions. I see Brady in the chat. Paul is gone. He must have had to do homework or eat lunch or something. I can ask him through text. It's fine. Um, I only had one random viewer, Kara. I wanted to ask her um, or him. <laughs> Uh, them. I want to ask them about their opinion. Um, they said they seem to really like it. I was glad to get a stranger involved. Um, that kind of thing. That That's good. Um, am I, am I live? <laughs> okay, I'm still alive. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a minute to come back. Um, so I'm still taking advice. It crashed. Yeah. I started having that trouble this, this week. Um, I fiddled with my ethernet cable and my connections. Um, maybe include some visual aids. Okay. Yeah. I would be fine with that. I'm down for that. Um, I think it's a good idea. Um, I think I'm done. I think I'm, I think I'm closing it. Uh, my throat is kind of raw from all this talking and hiking in a mountain filled with smoke yesterday for two hours, um, <clears throat> in the dark. I was only in the dark for like 20 minutes, but, um, do you have any, what today, what today is it? What day is it? It's Sunday. Um, I don't, I wasn't sure if I was going to stream after this. Um, <clears throat> inspiring to see you start streaming. I just moved and plan on streaming myself soon. Definitely following out. Good for you, man. I joined your Discord, so let's game together soon. Do you have time today? Like, good job, mate. Chewy subjects and great stories that made my brain pulse. 
Thanks, Brady. Um, like, if I take a break and eat lunch and come back in, like, an hour or two, we could start a Civ game if you're... I mean, it's Sunday. I know it's a time difference for you. For me, it's only noon. Um, we could come back and try a Civ game... Hopefully my internet wouldn't disconnect too much. Um, I was literally just going to play Civ all day. Only other plans is to play with some friends. Oh, play Among Us with some friends. Yeah, I've seen that game. I haven't tried it. It seems... It's been out for a minute. It's all of a sudden really popular. Um, I'm not sure why. I guess some popular streamer streamed it. I know it's like free-ish. It's like, or it's like 50 cents or something. And it's like a betrayal game, multiplayer betrayal game. So that, those are always popular. Um, so I understand why it's popular um, because of the genre and it's cheap, but um, I've been noticing it for a while and never saw it popular till recently. Um, people seem to be playing Among Us and that Fall Guys game, um, which I don't have. I haven't really seen anything from it. <sighs> Shit, my throat. Checking out, message me on Discord when you get back on. Gonna go eat and read good stuff. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna end the stream. Um, I gotta eat, rest my voice. Probably watch some TV. It's chill. Um, maybe be back with a Civ stream. We'll see. Um, bye. <laughs>